It is recording now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you have successfully joined the workshop uh, on the integrated resource planning preferred system plan analysis uh, in the IRP proceeding at the CPUC uh, and the ruling that was recently released. Uh, my name is James McGarry, uh, and I'm an analyst on the IRP team, and I will be leading off and presenting uh, during today's workshop. But you will also see presentations from other analysts on uh, both the integrated resource planning and the energy resource modeling teams um, who all contributed to the development uh, of the preferred system plan ruling. Uh, we are also joined on the panel today uh, by Molly Sterkel, a program manager for infrastructure planning and permitting, um, administrative law judge Julie Fitch, um, several of our consultants from E3, uh, the energy division consultants who uh, assisted with the technical modeling uh, um, of this uh, of the preferred system plan. Uh, we are very fortunate to be joined by. At my latest count, three commissioners, uh, CPUC commissioners, uh, Commissioner Rekshoffen, Commissioner Sharoma, and Commissioner Hauk. Um, so thank you, commissioners, uh, for joining. They're all here as panelists, uh, and we're lucky to have them. Uh, we're also joined by Commissioner Siva Gunda from the California Energy Commission. Uh, hello, Commissioner Gunda. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, before uh, getting started on the presentation, um, Commissioner Rekshoffen, would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much, James. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this workshop. Our IRP process depends on the very active and engaged stakeholder participation, and we're lucky to have that. And I look forward to a very productive discussion today. Uh, before we delve into the modeling details, I, I do want to highlight the extraordinary coordination and cooperation that we've had with our sister agencies, the Energy Commission, the Air Resources Board, and the PUC. There's a tremendous amount that goes into decarbonizing the grid and keeping it reliable, and we, we benefit greatly from that uh, cooperation. So, in addition to my colleagues that you mentioned, and I think President Batchel will be joining us by phone. She's had some WebEx problems, but Commissioners Hauk and Sharoma, I'd like to welcome also CEC Commissioner Gunda for attending today. Uh, Commissioner Gunda and the CEC have been very gracious inviting us to a number of workshops lately. We're very glad to return the favor. Although I think I've been to so many CEC workshops lately that Commissioner Gunda probably has nightmares every day he wakes up and he goes to work at a workshop and he sees me at another workshop. And today he's going to one outside the CEC and then he sees me again. So uh, uh, I'm sorry for that, Commissioner Gunda, but it's wonderful to have you and your, your team here. I encourage all of the members of the dais to post questions as they come up. I think that's okay, James and David, right? Uh, probably better than waiting till the end since we do have a lot of technical detailed information uh, we're going to be covering uh, today. We we issued a, a ruling on the preferred system plan uh, on in August, in which we posed a number of questions we'd like to get <clears throat> feedback on. We're hoping that today's very detailed presentation and discussion can answer questions that parties and commissioners have, and let's particularly help parties provide the best informed comments possible as we go forward with our continued decision making. As most of you know, in June, we issued a, a decision directing 11 and a half gigawatts of new clean energy procurement to be done over the next five years. And as we've said, and it's worth emphasizing again, this procurement will be a crucial step in decarbonizing the state's grid, uh, achieving our state's greenhouse gas goals while ensuring reliability as we retired the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant and other gas plants in, in the state. Uh, the analysis we are conducting right now in this preferred system plan process, along with the Energy Commission's parallel grid modeling process, is designed to test the resource portfolios that the various load serving entities 
have submitted to us. Uh, once we add in this 11 and a half gigawatts of authorized procurement. And to ensure that when we take everything together, the grid. Stays reliable uh, based on uh, the modeling presented during the CC's workshop on Monday. Uh, the the CC's con conclusion was that these resources are sufficient to meet our reliability standards through 2026. So I'm very happy at that confirmation from the CC's modeling results thus far. Uh, we asked a number of questions, tough questions, important questions uh, in this ruling, and, and we'll, we'll be talking about many of those today, whether to or accelerate procurement, whether it's necessary to order new fossil resources, whether to consider geographically targeted procurement and others, and, and those will be coming up during the course of the discussion. So I, before we break, I want to thank James and his colleagues. We have a indefatigable IRP team who put together this extremely detailed, meaty, and informative presentation. You'll hear it. They've also spent countless, countless hours on the analysis that led to this ruling in the workshop. I want to call them out because they all deserve it. This includes Nathan Barsik, who's the IRP team supervisor, along with Molly Sterkel, who is one notch above Nathan in, in the energy division hierarchy. James McGarry, who you've heard from, Neil Raffin, Carolina Maslanka, Jared Ferguson, Ali Azrahi, Lauren Reiser, and David, Rith, uh, David Withrow. We have a, a, a top-notch modeling team that contributed a great deal to this effort as well, headed up by Donald Brooks. It also includes analysts Munor Falahi and David Miller. I want to thank Judge Fitch, who's an incredibly important and talented partner in all these efforts, and she's here today. And I also want to thank our excellent consultants, uh, E3. Uh, before we go back to James, I want to see if any of my colleagues on the dais, Commissioner Halk, Commissioner Sharoma, Commissioner Gunda, and President Batcher, if she's been able to join, if they want to make any opening remarks. Uh, this is uh, Genevieve Sharoma. I'll go next. Thank you, Commissioner Rexroth. And uh, in, in addressing the preferred system portfolio, it it really is the vision, the roadmap, uh, and in pursuing this, this workshop will be invaluable as we continue to be nimble to address what we need to do to achieve greenhouse gas reductions and reliability targets. I also uh, echo the thanks that Commissioner Rakshoffen outlined to the team that has brought us to this point, uh, including the our partners, the Energy Commission, uh, and I look forward to the staff presentation and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rachel, I just want to thank you for your leadership on this, uh, Judge Fitch, and all of the Energy Division uh, team that's been doing such great work. And I'm looking forward to hearing more and learning. And I'll keep my remarks short because I know we're running a little bit late. And just appreciate Commissioner um, Gunda's uh, participation in today's workshop. Uh, um, Commissioner Raman, I have joined by phone. Okay, great. President Batcher, would you like to make some opening remarks? I would like only just to thank you, my Bagley Keen partner, on this incredible effort, and um, also thank the uh, incredible, <laughs> uh, brilliant ALJ Judge Fitch. And um, I look, as, as my fellow commissioners have said, and I'm sorry to have missed your remarks, um, Commissioner Rekshaven, but I very much look forward to um, this very important workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, President Badger. Uh, Commissioner Gunda? Yeah, um, thank you, Commissioner Rekshaf. And I, I wanted to say something witty, but I cannot match you. So I'm going <laughs> to leave my wit out of it. But I, I just want to um, really uh, thank the IRP team and, and you for inviting me to the workshop today. Um, as um, as you noted, the IRP team is, uh, I think it's a good word, infatigable, it's a great word to use, and um, are, are incredibly uh, talented and committed um, 
as staff that have, you know, that are playing a critical role in decarbonizing the economy um, and helping the state move forward, um, you know, towards our climate goals and, and doing so, I'm sure will set the stage for the nation and the globe. So I just want to um, you know, share my deep appreciation for the IRP team's dedication in moving the ball forward. Um, Commissioner Kshaf, and I also want to thank you for taking the time to attend most of our IPER workshops this year at the Energy Commission. Uh, your attendance there and the continued ongoing uh, collaboration between the two agencies is, um, right, to me, essential in making sure we as a state move forward together, um, and particularly your ability to um, you know, provide feedback to our team at CEC uh, in the most thoughtful and generous way. Uh, I just want to thank you for, for all, your, all your time on that. Um, and, and just closing, uh, I just I just want to say, you know, um, so much of all this work is is people, uh, people and people. Um, so I, I'm just grateful for your team, not you know, about being just competent, also are extremely generous and gracious uh, of people. So I'm, I'm just looking forward to learning from them today. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very kind remarks. Uh, I think. Uh, I think we're done, James, unless anyone, if does anyone else want to speak? Otherwise, we'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Rekshoffen and, uh, and all commissioners. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Um, so here's the outline uh, that we'll be following. Um, we'll, we'll kick it off with uh, some background uh, on, on the process, aggregation, how we develop the preferred system plan. Before we go into uh, some of the reliability uh, and deeper emissions modeling that was done on the uh, proposed plan. Uh, at that point, um, that should take roughly the first two hours of the workshop. Uh, we've got a 10 minute break scheduled. Um, we'll, we'll try to keep it uh, to 10 minutes, although depending on how we're doing with time, uh, you know, maybe it'll be a, a we'll, we'll see where we are there. Uh, and then from there, we'll talk about the transmission planning process. Uh, and then some of the um, procurement and uh, other potential actions that uh, Commissioner Rekshoffen was uh, uh, talking about in his opening remarks. Um, uh, on the next couple slides, uh, I'll just go over um, some of the ground rules um, and logistics for today's workshop. Uh, the slides are now available on our website, um, so you can go to the IRP events and materials webpage um, to download this slide deck, as well as all other ruling materials. Uh, this workshop is recorded, um, and the recording is also going to be posted on the same web page. Um, the purpose of this workshop, uh, as, as others have said, is to advance everybody's understanding uh, of the preferred system plan development process uh, and the analysis that led to the uh, proposed preferred system plan in the, uh, in the, in the ruling and to uh, solicit stakeholder feedback uh, both during this workshop and to inform stakeholder comments on the ruling. Um, for, uh, for, for those who would like to ask questions, um, we certainly invite questions in, uh, in, in written format uh, through the Q&A section of, of the WebEx. So um, in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, you'll see a Q&A chat box. So at any time, you can feel free to submit your question um, about whatever is being said in the ruling. And then during the designated Q&A sections, uh, we will um, we will be taking taking up those questions. All right. So now let's get into it. Um, all right. So I'm going to talk about the background now of IRP. Many people who have attended IRP workshops in the past have seen this flowchart before of how an IRP cycle operates. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole diagram now because I'm going to talk more about the IRP cycle that we're currently in on the next slide. This is just to point out through the red circle uh, that we are now at the end of the 2019 to 2021 cycle uh, at the stage where the CPUC develops a preferred system plan. Next slide, please. Uh, the IRP planning process is divided into two halves, and right now we are in the second half. The first half of IRP, which is very much led by the commission and commission staff, is where the CPUC identifies an optimal portfolio 
for meeting state policy objectives uh, and to encourage load serving entities or LSEs to plan towards that future. This part of the cycle was completed in March 2020 when the commission adopted a reference system plan or RSP. The RSP established the optimal reference system portfolio of resources to meet the adopted electric sector target of 46 million metric tons in 2030. Uh, that decision also established an optimal portfolio for meeting a 38 million metric ton electric sector target, uh, which was made available for planning purposes. The second half of the IRP cycle has a lot more LSE input. It's, a, it's really an LSE led uh, portion of the cycle. And this is where the CPUC collects and then aggregates uh, the LSE's collective efforts for planned and contracted resources and then compares the electric system that would result from their planning to the identified optimal portfolio set forth in the RSP. This part of the cycle started exactly one year ago today on September 1, 2020, when LSEs filed their IRPs or their LSE plans, which detailed exactly how they would achieve their share of both a 46 and a 38 million metric ton GHG planning target through a mix of uh, contracted and planned resources. Those plans have all been aggregated and they were used to form the proposed preferred system plan that we're discussing today. Next slide, please. Uh, another key and relevant piece of IRP that informs the preferred system plan is the procurement track. Uh, the commission has now issued two procurement orders. The first issued in 2019 ordered the development of 3,300 megawatts of net qualifying capacity uh, to come online by 2023. The second order, which was issued uh, just this last June, uh, is commonly referred to as the Midterm Reliability or MTR order. Uh, and this ordered the development of 11,500 megawatts NQC uh, of clean energy resources by 2026 uh, to maintain system reliability. These two tracks of IRP, the planning and procurement track, are linked. Information about contracted resources submitted in IRP uh, plans last year were used to help develop the need determination in the MTR order. Commission staff has also gone to great lengths to ensure that order procurement amounts are reflected in the PSP portfolio. Next slide, please. Uh, before I go into how we aggregated the plans, I'm just going to walk through the timeline uh, for completing the preferred system plan. The ruling was issued on August 17th, and parties are now invited to submit their comments and reply comments on September 27th and October 11th. Uh, from September through October, staff will review those comments and conduct any needed uh, modeling reruns and portfolio adjustments. Um, we'll also review the CEC's reliability analysis, uh, which they just presented draft results for on Monday. Uh, this time period will also be when staff conducts bus bar mapping for the CAISO's transmission planning process, which will be discussed in more detail later in this workshop. And all of that puts us on track for a proposed decision to be issued in November and a final decision uh, that we are targeting to adopt uh, in December. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, individual LSE plans, uh, how they were analyzed and aggregated um, and used to develop the preferred system plan. As I discussed in the background section just now, LSEs filed their individual plans on September 1, 2020. These plans are essentially how the LSEs tell us how they plan to procure over the next 10 years to meet their assigned greenhouse gas goals while meeting their RPS, RA, and other requirements. LSEs also report on other priorities in their plans, such as how they plan to pursue uh, activities to achieve their uh, the procurement envisioned in their plans how they plan to conduct outreach and seek input from disadvantaged communities, uh, and how their proposed portfolios will impact customer costs and rates, and uh, potential barriers that they foresee in achieving their plan procurement, just to name a few of the uh, additional items that they, procure, that they report on. These filings uh, are the vehicle by which the CPC and other stakeholders gain insight into how LSEs plan to meet state goals. Uh, they are also what makes the IRP an interactive process which is informed by LSE preferences and priorities, rather than just being a top-down centralized planning process. Next slide, please. So IRP plans consist of three filings. There's the narrative template, 
which describes in a qualitative way how LSEs develop their plans and uh, presents the results of their analysis. There's the resource data template or RDT, which is an Excel file in which LSEs submit monthly contract data across the 10 year planning horizon for all planned and existing resources, including future resources, which do not yet exist. This gives us a snapshot estimate of each LSE's monthly total energy and capacity forecast positions over a 10 year look ahead period. And it's the filing that we most relied on for uh, aggregation. LSE submitted uh, at least two of these, one for their 38 million metric ton uh, portfolio and another for their 46 million metric ton portfolio. Finally, uh, LSE submit a clean system power calculator or CSP calculator, which is a tool for estimating the GHG, the greenhouse gas and criteria pollution emissions of their portfolios. Uh, this is the, the template that verifies that the resources contained in each RDT are sufficient to meet each LSE's assigned 38 and 46 million metric ton GHG benchmark. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna talk about how we went about aggregating all of the resource data templates. So the first step, as the first step, staff developed something called the RDT Error Checking Aggregation and Reallocation Tool, or RECART, which was a very useful tool uh, that used Python, Python code to aggregate, error check, and analyze LSE RDT filings, compiling all of the reported energy and capacity data by technology type, by contract status, by LSE, and other relevant category metrics. Uh, this tool was crucial uh, to our process in being able to meaningfully analyze the more than 80 RDTs that we had to aggregate. Recart also generated LSE-specific error reports for when errors were found in those RDTs. Some of these errors were inconsistencies within a plan. Like for example, maybe a contract status didn't match the resource type, like an LSE said that the contract was online, but the resource type said it was planned. Uh, and since both of those things can't be true, we would have to go back to the LSE uh, to, to find out what they really meant uh, and get them to, to resubmit. Uh, with each RDT containing thousands of rows and dozens of columns of data, and each LSE submitting two RDTs, one for each target, it's easy to see how these little mistakes could happen across the 40 plus uh, LSEs submitting plans. Then there were other types of errors that had to be checked for uh, that would only become apparent during aggregation. For example, maybe we would have three or four LSEs that are all claiming to contract with the same resource and collectively their planned contract, contract amounts might exceed the physical capacity of that resource. In that instance, we know that uh, someone may be over-reporting uh, the, the contract value, but it's not possible for us to know which one. And so we would have to contact all the LSEs claiming that resource uh, to verify their contract amounts. Uh, so as I think every LSE attending this workshop can attest, this led to a lot of back and forth between commission and LSE staff with uh, some LSEs needing to file five or six resubmissions between September and March uh, before all the inconsistencies could be worked out and RECART could produce error-free reports. But this was a very important effort that got us to a place where we could be sure that we were working from plans that fully reflected LSE planning and priorities. Next slide, please. Another aspect of aggregation involved the non-jurisdictional LSEs. Because CPC jurisdictional LSEs make up a little over 90% of the CAISO load, staff also worked with CC staff to get RDTs from the in-CAISO publicly owned utilities, or POUs, that make up the remainder of CAISO load. These RDTs were filled out by CC staff and contain information about existing contracts held by POUs for online and in-development resources located in or deliverable to the CAISO. These POU resources were aggregated with all other LSE resources to provide a full picture of current and expected resource contracting across the CAISO. Next slide, please. So the next two slides are going to show the results of the aggregated LSE portfolios. This slide shows how the aggregated 46 million metric ton plans, uh, th this shows, shows the 46 million metric ton plans, and the next slide shows the aggregated 38 MMT plans. This information is all publicly available on our website, and there are slides in the appendix that break this information down further by LSE type, 
and compare the build outs uh, in the aggregated plans to the reference system portfolio. There are a few things that I want to point out about this portfolio. Uh, first, the growth rate is fairly constant across the horizon, as you may notice. Uh, the trend that we noticed when putting together uh, these plans was that a lot of the early growth, particularly in solar and paired resources, was largely driven by the CCAs, many of whom have aggressive near-term RPS and uh, GHG reduction goals that are driving more near-term build. Those, those are internal goals. Uh, in terms of renewable resources, there was also a spike of resources coming online in 2030 uh, to meet the greenhouse gas goal um, with the IOUs in particular, largely waiting towards the end of the planning horizon uh, to bring online wind and, wind and solar resources for GHG reasons. There was a more near-term emphasis by LSEs to bring on batteries, uh, both through standalone and paired battery resources. Uh, although LSEs submitted their plans before the MTR decision, the near-term emphasis on reliability was likely driven both by D1911016, uh, the 3300 megawatt uh, procurement order, and the large addition of battery resources by mid-decade in the reference system portfolio, which LSEs uh, used to help inform their plan development. The greenhouse gas results are also interesting, so I'm going to talk about those for a little bit. When we initially aggregated all the plans, we found that they achieve uh, 44.8, basically 45 million metric ton uh, emissions by 2030, so slightly below the 46 million metric ton target. Uh, this was aggregated emissions as measured by the aggregate uh, clean system power calculators. However, when we further analyzed emissions through production cost modeling, which will be discussed in more detail later in this presentation, uh, we estimated that the LSE plans may emit um, closer to 48.5 million metric tons by 2030, so slightly above the 46 million metric ton target. Uh, they were also found to not achieve acceptable levels of reliability, uh, but I'll talk about that more in the next section. One uh, key reason for this, um, this difference in emissions likely has to do with some LSEs planning to contract with existing resources to meet their greenhouse gas goals. For example, an LSE may say that they intend to go out and sign a contract with an existing hydro or existing wind resource that is online now and that they expect will be uncontracted in the future when the LSE needs it as a source of low carbon energy. Uh, this is a perfectly reasonable way to procure, but if every LSE decides to do that, then some of them will probably not be able to find all of the uncontracted greenhouse gas free energy uh, that they need out there in the market. And this is exactly what we observed in aggregating LSE plans. IRP staff analysis of LSE plans shows that LSEs are collectively planning to contract with uncontracted renewable and zero carbon resources in the future at a faster rate than we saw existing con contracts rolling off in LSE plans. This indicates that those LSEs uh, that are planning to contract with uncontracted and existing renewable and zero carbon resources in the future may find difficulty finding those resources uh, in the market and should probably consider contingency strategies for achieving their GHG goals if they're unable to find uncontracted existing resources. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the aggregated 38 million metric ton portfolio. Uh, it's directionally the same story as the aggregated 46 MMT plans, uh, although we see a larger jump in GHG free resources in 2030 to meet the tighter GHG target. The greenhouse gas story is also largely the same. The initial aggregation of plans resulted in system emissions of 35.9 uh, million metric tons by 2030, so about 2 million metric ton, million metric tons less than the 38 MMT target uh, when measured by CSP calculators. However, production cost modeling found that LSC plans may emit uh, closer to 43.5 million metric tons by 2030. So that is 5 million metric tons less than the PCM results of the aggregated 46 MMT plans, but it's still well above the targeted emissions level. Again, we think this is largely due to LSE's planning for more existing resources that may be available in the marketplace, and LSEs should consider how they might be able to contract with new resources if they find insufficient quantities of existing resources. Next slide, please. Here's a graph showing the delta 
between the new resource additions between the 46 and 38 MMT plans shows what resources LSEs relied on to close the emissions gap between the two emissions targets. And uh, this here shows a difference of about five and a half gigawatts. Not surprisingly, LSEs largely relied on new wind and solar resources when planning for a tighter greenhouse gas target uh, with a small amount of geothermal and standalone impaired battery storage as well. Uh, this also shows that the planning uh, included in the two portfolios is fairly similar in the early part of the planning horizon uh, with, a, with the bigger jump happening closer to 2030 to meet that tighter uh, greenhouse gas target. Uh, I will also note that this that the growth here that you're looking at is driven almost entirely by CCAs and IOUs. Uh, most of the ESPs relied on contracting with existing resources to close that final emissions gap. Next slide, please. Uh, so a few conclusions from plan aggregation before I talk about uh, the capacity expansion modeling. Portfolio size and composition uh, were generally consistent uh, with the reference system portfolio, um, but did not contain the minimum procurement amounts from the MTR order, unsurprisingly, because LSE submitted their plans before the MTR order. Aggregated portfolios included more technology types than the RSP, uh, reflecting the various interests of, of the different LSEs, but the amounts of diverse resources being planned for, like geothermal, long duration storage, offshore and out-of-state wind, some biomass, were generally small and uncontracted. CCAs have the most planned procurement with a heavy emphasis on GHG-free resources, resources, followed by the utilities who were planning for a higher proportion of uh, new battery resources. Um, the ESPs generally didn't plan to procure incremental new resources in their 38s um, relative to their 46s. So to close the emissions gap, uh, they were relying on existing on existing resources. And uh, a key conclusion here is that all LSEs were planning to contract with uncontracted and existing renewable and zero carbon resources in the future may find difficulty finding those resources. It looks like there will be uh, competition among those resource types and uh, and should consider alternative strategies to meet their, their GHG goals, their contingency strategies. All right, uh, next slide, please. So this is going to be my last section before we hit the first uh, Q&A session of the workshop. I'm going to talk about the capacity expansion modeling that we did to top off the aggregated portfolios and develop the recommended preferred system portfolio. To develop the preferred system plan portfolios, staff worked with our consultants at E3 to run the Resolve capacity expansion model. Uh, and we did that for several reasons. First, the aggregated LC plans, as I just discussed, uh, did not achieve acceptable, acceptable levels of reliability, and did not reach the GHG target. Uh, second, the commission issued the MTR procurement order after the development of LC plans. And so we wanted to make sure that those resources were reflected in the final PSP. Uh, also, LSC plans only went out to 2030, and we needed a portfolio to go out to at least 2032 uh, so that we would be able to submit it to the CAISO or the transmission planning process. And lastly, we wanted sensitivity portfolios to inform decision making and manage risk by seeing how the potential PSP might change under a variety of future conditions. So we ran the resolve model, forcing in uh, the resources included in LSE plans, so that they would be um, uh, forcing those in, so that they would be included in the portfolio. Uh, but then resolve would select additional resources on top of that to solve for uh, the other issues that I just discussed. There were also a variety of modeling updates uh, that were made prior to running the model. Um, those are described on this slide, and you can find further details about the exact modeling updates that we made, uh, both in the ruling and in the resolve update slide deck that we released uh, and posted on our website uh, prior to the ruling. Slide, please. So now I'm going to talk about the portfolio that the ruling recommends as the PSP portfolio, which is also called the 38 million metric ton core portfolio. Next slide, please. 
the primary case that we ran was the 38 MMT core. This case has a 38 million metric ton GHG target for 2030. It includes the LSE uh, 38 MMT plans, and it also includes the MTR high need reliability constraints that led to the 11,500 megawatt procurement order. It also includes resources selected by Resolve for 2031 and 2032. The purpose of this case was to understand what KISO system resources would be needed, uh, would need to be added on top of the 38 million metric ton plans to meet the, uh, the 2030 GHG target and the MTR order. Uh, in the following slides, I'm going to talk about the selected resources in the 38 MMT core portfolio, the uh, planning reserve margin reliability results, the GHG emission results, and the transmission selection. Uh, details and insights, as well as um, more information about the sensitivity portfolios that we ran. So this is the 38 MMT core uh, selected resource portfolio. Uh, the left side of the chart runs from 2022 to 2032, and this is the rulings proposed PSP portfolio that we would uh, be transmitting to the CAISO for the TPP. The right side of the chart includes modeling years 2035 through 2045. While these years were included in the modeling, they were more informational and would not be part of the official PSP portfolio that we transmit. There are a few things going on in this slide that I'll walk through. Through the middle part of this decade, you see uh, a big chunk of resources coming online, and the two main drivers of that are LSE plans and CPUC procurement orders. The solar uh, resources are driven uh, primarily by LSE plans. Like I said earlier, there was an early emphasis on these resources, particularly by the CCAs, in part to reach their own internal goals. By 2024, the solar build reaches 11,000 megawatts, which pushes right up against the model's annual build limits. The portfolio also includes 12 and a half gigawatts of battery storage uh, getting selected by 2025, uh, which is well in excess of the six gigawatts uh, of storage from LSE plans alone. Uh, in addition to 400 megawatts of demand response. Uh, not surprisingly, you're seeing a big influx of high-end QC reliability resources appearing in the middle part of the decade uh, due to the CPUC's procurement orders uh, and the need for reliability resources in that part of the planning horizon. So that is reflective of the high need uh, determination constraints that were uh, included in, in the model. Uh, the appearance of three and a half gigawatts of in-state wind, mostly by mid-decade, is also partly driven by midterm reliability, as well as the model choosing to build uh, wind earlier to capture the expiring federal production tax credit. The amount of wind in this portfolio is consistent with the amount of wind included in LSE plans, uh, but Resolve is choosing to build that wind earlier uh, to capture both its incremental reliability value and to bank the PTC. 2028, we see geothermal and pump storage appear. These resources were forced into the portfolio to reflect the uh, MTR procurement order, which required two gigawatts of procurement from long duration storage and clean firm resources. Uh, pump storage and geothermal were modeled as stand-ins for that requirement, uh, although in practice, other technologies could, could qualify. That decision requires those resources to come online by 2026, but allows LSEs to request up to two years of delay with that compliance requirement. In PSP modeling, uh, in order to be conservative, we assume that LSEs uh, would request that two-year delay. Uh, finally, by 2030, and particularly in 2032, you see the emergence of out-of-state wind and offshore wind. There are uh, a couple things going on here that's leading to their selection. First, Resolve found it more cost-effective to develop new out-of-state wind rather than building the more expensive in-state transmission that would be needed to accommodate uh, the levels of in-state wind included in LSE plans. So the least uh, cost option selected by Resolve was, uh, you know, in addition to the in-state wind, to, uh, to build 1,500 megawatts of uh, what I believe was Wyoming wind that would inter interconnect the CAISO at the El Dorado substation in Southern Nevada. By 2030. Second, the Federal uh, Investment Tax Credit, or ITC, turned out to be a big driver for offshore wind. The IRS issued guidance last December saying that if an offshore wind project can show that it invested 5% or more of the total cost of the project by the end of 2025, 
and makes continuous efforts to advance toward completion of that project, that it will qualify for safe harbor where it has 10 years to bring a project online and still qualify for the investment tax credit. The ITC eligibility helped resolve to select 1,700 megawatts of offshore wind uh, by 2032 at Morro Bay, uh, which would utilize existing transmission infrastructure. The 2035 to 2045 results, which again were uh, produced largely for informational purposes, uh, show largely a growth in solar and batteries to meet the growing demand while reducing GHGs and maintaining reliability. Notably, the model chooses to retain nearly all gas uh, by 2045 to meet the higher, uh, to help meet the higher liability constraints. Uh, the model also selects more wind and geothermal uh, in 2045. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I'm gonna dig into the resolves reliability results. This shows what was happening with the reliability constraints in the model that drove the selection of resources to maintain system reliability. The next section, Munir is going to present the servant production cost modeling analysis to detail the deep dive reliability analysis that was performed on the proposed PSP. Uh, the table on the left shows the planning reserve margins or PRMs that were input into Resolve. PRM refers to the amount of generation capacity incremental to the projected annual peak demand that needs to be available on the system. This is the constraint that Resolve used to ensure reliability. To reflect the MTR decision, Resolve was set up to use the same PRM that was used in the high need determination scenario of that order, while also maintaining the long lead time flexibility provided in the MTR decision. The MTR decision used a 22.5% PRM starting in 2024, so that was reflected in Resolve so that Resolve would build uh, capacity sufficient to meet that order. Uh, as I discussed earlier, however, the order also allows up to a two-year delay of the 2026 ordered long lead time resources. And this flexibility uh, was also reflected in Resolve as discussed on the last slide. This results in the PRM dip that you see in the model for 2025 and 2026. This was basically done to avoid Resolve procuring a 22 point, procuring two a 22.5% PRM in 2026, and then being forced to over procure above that uh, when the long lead time resources come online in 2028. In other words, in the modeling, we shifted the PRM a little bit so that the selected build out would more closely resemble what it might actually look like in the real world. Adjustments to the PRM do not represent the PRM used in the RA program and are not meant to reflect ongoing PRM changes in the planning track of IRP either. They were simply implemented in Resolve to develop the PSP so that portfolios accurately reflect the impacts of the MTR decision. The right graph shows the shadow price of RA capacity in the model. A zero price means that reliability was not a binding constraint in the model, meaning that portfolio, meaning that the portfolio meets PRM, uh, and so is reliable in that uh, modeling year, and the model doesn't see the need to select more resources for reliability reasons. As you see here, MTR results in a high midterm cost of capacity, meaning that the model has to build uh, a lot to meet the higher PRM in conjunction with the retirement of Diablo Canyon and uh, the once through cooling fossil fuel power plants. That was the reason for the MTR order. The capacity picture gets significantly better as you move uh, past the mid part of the decade, where lower prices indicate a slower pace of capacity additions needed to maintain a reliability as the system gets used to the higher PRM and the GHG constraint is also acting to drive continued procurement. Next slide, please. In this slide, I'm going to dig into Resolve's greenhouse gas emission results. This shows what was happening with the GHG constraint in the model that drove the selection of resources to achieve the needed reductions. Again, Munir will present the Servem production cost modeling analysis in the next section uh, to detail further emissions analysis that was conducted uh, on the proposed PSP. The graph on the left uh, shows modeled emissions results of the portfolio and the stacked bars, and the line above those bars shows the GHG target that was in Resolve. Uh, which hits Kaiso's share of a 38 MMT uh, emissions target in 2030. As you can see, the portfolio emissions re remain below the emissions target until 2030, at which point the GHG constraint becomes binding. This, this leads Resolve to select 286 megawatts of utility scale solar uh, uh, in 2030, and that's additional to what's already included in LSE plans and what will be needed to meet the MTR procurement order. 
These results indicate that the combination of LLC plans and CPUC procurement orders are largely sufficient to meet the 38 million metric ton target by 2030, with only a small additional quantity of solar needed to close the remaining emissions gap. Uh, and at the right, uh, as the GHG target gets tighter after 2030, you can see the GHG reduction shadow price uh, showing the constraint becoming more binding and more resources getting built for greenhouse gas reduction reasons. Uh, on the next slide, lastly, I will uh, briefly touch on the transmission upgrades identified in Resolve in the 38 MMT core portfolio. Uh, and I'm just going to do this at a high level because Carolina Maslanka will discuss this in more detail during her uh, presentation about the TPP. The first thing that jumps out in these results is that few transmission upgrades are being selected through 2032. And that those that are being selected are partial and relative, relatively inexpensive. Large upgrades to the transmission system in this portfolio are not being shown uh, as needed until the 2040 to 2045 timeframe. This is driven uh, by large battery and solar buildouts that at that point exceed transmission limits. It's important to point out here that there are fewer upgrades being selected uh, compared to previous resolve runs that have been done in IRP. This is mainly due to updated transmission limits released by CAISO in July, which generally increase the amount of available capacity on the transmission system relative to previous values that we've used in our modeling, although this is not true for every constraint. Uh, more information about the transmission results and the changes and uh, changes to the constraints and deliverability methodology can be found in the ruling and the resolve updates deck that was posted on our website. Okay, next I'm going to go over some of the sensitivity portfolios that we ran uh, as part of this process. Due to limited time today, I'm not going to be able to go into a ton of detail about each portfolio and how it's developed. Uh, so this will just be an overview with some notable highlights pulled out. Um, this is just here for reference. This is all of the scenarios that we ran uh, on the next slide. You'll see a summary of the different GHG target sensitivities that we ran. On the left is a 38 MMT core scenario that we were just looking at, and it's included here as a point of reference. Uh, the following portfolios going from left to right are the 46 MMT core, and this meets a 46 MMT GHG target in 2030 uh, with 46 MMT LSE plans forced in. Relative to the 38 MMT core portfolio, this portfolio causes Resolve to select about six gigawatts less resources than in the 38 MMT core scenario, with the reduction coming from out of state and offshore wind and solar. You'll notice that our estimate of the 2032 residential rate impact is actually a little higher than the 38 MMT core portfolio. That's because the resources procured for meeting MTR when combined with the 46 million metric ton plans uh, already pushed the GHG emissions lower than 46 million metric tons by 2030. So the difference between achieving the resource build out is lower than the operating cost savings achieved from reduced usage of the thermal fleet. Uh, next, the 30, the, the 30 MMT core portfolio, that was uh, a sensitivity we ran, which meets a 30 million metric ton target in 2030, uh, and it has the LSE's 38 million metric tons uh, plans forced in, and Resolve selects on top of that to meet the deeper target. Relative to the 38 MMT core, this portfolio causes Resolve to select about nine gigawatts of more resources, with the addition coming mostly from solar, batteries, and a little bit of out-of-state wind. And then we ran a 30 million metric ton high electrification case, which is the same as the 30 MMT core, but assumes faster growth of transportation and building electrification uh, using a managed load shape that comes from the CEC's IPER. Relative to the 30 MMT core, the increased load in this scenario is mostly served by additional solar and battery resources, as well as 100 megawatts of additional in-state uh, onshore wind capacity. Next slide, please. James, I hate to interrupt your flow, but just a quick time check um, and noting that there on this slide in the next two, there's 12 cases to get through. Um, were you planning on perhaps doing super high level um, and maybe orientation to these cases? Um, yeah, yeah, I'll leave that open to you. Yeah, I can, uh, I can kind of breeze through uh, these two. Thanks, Nathan. Um, yeah, so in, in this slide, uh, it's different cases on the 38 MMT target. Uh, the first is high electrification. Uh, the second is a 38 MMT without LSE plans forced in, which is essentially a rerun of the, uh, of the RSP with the new constraints and resolve. 
Uh, and then we ran another case where we removed the MTR liability constraints after 2026. Um, I'll say that for high electrification, the results were largely the same as the delta between the 30 and the 30 MMT and the 30 MMT high electrification case. And the uh, for when LSE plans were not forced in, uh, we saw that the build out is very close to 38 MMT core, uh, a little bit less wind. Uh, but also relatively this, uh, similar cost, uh, which gives us confidence that um, the factoring in LSE plans does not come at significant cost premium. Uh, on the next slide, um, this is a few other sensitivities that we ran. Um, you can see the high electrification without a managed load shape. Uh, we assumed high cost uh, battery and solar, uh, and we looked at a scenario with um, where the offshore wind does not qualify for a safe harbor uh, standard, uh, which leads to less offshore wind and more uh, solar and batteries. And then the last case, um, last set of scenarios, use the 2020 IPER. Um, the results are largely the same. Uh, one used the 2020 instead of uh, the 2020 mid mid uh, IPER scenario, and then another one used the 20 I 2020 IPER mid mid with uh, high EVs. Um, that's just a, a way of saying that we uh, that we updated to the most recent IPER, IPER forecast and ran with a sensitivity that includes more transportation electrification. Uh, we are very, the, the commission, in, uh, the ruling suggested that the commission is strongly considering uh, that scenario with uh, the 2020 IPER and high EVs as the final uh, PSP as a way to move towards higher uh, planning for higher electrification. Uh, and we, the commission staff is currently configuring our production cost model uh, to be able to test this portfolio for reliability. So with that, uh, I will, uh, we can open it up for questions. James, thanks for that. Let me just remind everyone um, regarding our new Q and A format. It's pretty straightforward. James explained it close to the top. But if you just go to the lower right hand side of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box and inside that you will see um, a bar to which you can direct your question to all panelists and that way we can all see it um, and respond hopefully right now. So we got five or six questions over the course of that um, and we'll try to answer them in sequence now. So from Ellen Wolf, um, regarding folding in of non jurisdictional LSE plans. Can you tell us where we can see more info on how those plans were folded into the portfolios? And can you confirm if and how co-ops info was included, given that they don't file plans with the PUC or CEC? Uh, yeah, so we worked with, um, with CEC staff uh, on development of RDTs for the, for the POUs. Um, we did not get plan information from uh, the co-ops. Um, they're, they're pretty small share of Kaiso load, uh, and um, we didn't have readily available uh, information to feed in. But uh, working with CEC staff, they were able to, um, as I said, provide information on resources that are currently contracted uh, and online or that were in development. Uh, and so we included those with the aggregated LSE plans uh, from the jurisdictional LSEs. All of those POU resources are in the baseline uh, because they already have contracts. So when you look at the PSP portfolio, that does not include POU resources, uh, but know that those resources are sitting on top of a baseline that does include um, publicly owned utility uh, planning. Um, it looks like Nathan may have lost yes. connection here. Um, so let's see what the next question is in, uh, from Julia Levin. In determining GHG emissions and reductions for each portfolio, the CPUC is the CPUC considering the life cycle emissions of each resource type or just avoided emissions from fossil fuels. Um, it would be more avoided emissions. We did not take into account life cycle emissions uh, in, in IRP modeling. 
Uh, Jan Reed asked, why do you believe that LSEs will have difficulty procuring existing renewables? Yeah, so this is what I was um, getting at in the analysis that we did. We observed that we, 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 could, we could look at two categories of uh, contract statuses when analyzing LSE plans. One is online, meaning that the LSEs have a contract with the with with a given resource, um, and that that contract is already in effect. Another one is called planned existing, meaning that the LSE is planning to go out and contract with an uncontracted resource in the future, even though they don't currently have that resource under contract. And so, over time, going out to 2030, we did see a drop off in uh, online contracts, meaning that. Uh, existing contracts were rolling off, uh, which you know, indicates that they will be available in the marketplace um, for uh, for recontracting. And we saw this for solar resources, wind resources, hydro resources, uh, but we saw a much faster growth in planned existing, uh, which indicates that you know if, if we see say a five gigawatts of demand of um, of for, for for contracting with existing resources, but we only see one gigawatt of gigawatts of contracts rolling off, then that exceedance is where uh, we think that four gigawatts of that demand will not be able to find uh, those contracts and may have difficulty finding those contracts. Um, so that's what led to the conclusion that we think that there's going to be uh, some difficulty uh, for everybody to contract with all the existing resources that they want. I don't know if we have Nathan back. If not, uh, on slide 23, as mentioned, this is from uh, Pushkar Boggle. As mentioned in the ALJ ruling, LSE plans include a New Mexico and Pacific Northwest wind resources on existing transmission, uh, but, not, but no out-of-state resources requiring new transmission. Given this, why are you forcing out-of-state wind resources uh, requiring new transmission in the scenarios? Change. This is Nathan. I'm back on. Um, you might have part of this answer. I think that Jared and Neith, we also have some thinking. Jared, do you want to give it a crack? Yeah, I can. This is Jared Ferguson also with the IRP team. Uh, the reason why that happened was that with the uh, existing transmission limits and upgrade information that the ISO provided in their updated white paper on transmission that was incorporated into the resolve model, those new constraints and upgrades restricted the amount of wind resources uh, available that could be selected within wind areas uh, to meet the LSE plan. So to be able to have a portfolio that um, met the amount of wind uh, that LSEs selected, uh, resolve, resolve was allowed to build out of state wind on new transmission. Thanks, James. Dr. Jared. Yeah, James, I don't know if you had anything else to add. No, that, that, that covered it. Thanks, Jared. And Jared, does that also cover Pushkar's follow-up? Uh, uh, no, I can add some more. Uh, so, yes, for out-of-state wind on new transmission from, example, the Wyoming resources, uh, it does consider the internal upgrades based on that same white paper that would be needed. Uh, within the ISO balancing area authority. Great, thanks, Jared. I think we can move on to the next question from Mark Speck. I'm from slide 26, can you explain why GHG emissions don't decrease very much over the course of the next decade, despite huge amounts of resource addition? Is it just because of load growth in Diablo Canyon's retirement? Any other factors? Um, Mark, I think you uh, hit it pretty close to the head here. Um, I think we'd call Diablo Canyon's retirement as the primary driver, um, and maybe load growth, which is in about the 5% range as a secondary one. Um, you could also probably picture from your own analysis that um, the GHG uh, target ramps down kind of linearly over the course of the next 10 years. I mean, it doesn't become binding until a little bit later on. Um, I'd also add in that, you know, the MTR order and its characterization here has a lot of clean resources coming online mid-decade, and those probably enable um, us to run um, a little bit cleaner. Uh, 
Another question from Pushkar on slide 30. Would you please provide some insights into why the 38 MMT and no MTR persistent scenario results in some gas capacity not being retained? Yeah, I can field this one. Um, yeah, basically what, what the model sees when you take away the PRM constraints after 2026 is that, um, is that the system is overbuilt uh, because by 2026, it's built up to a 22.5% PRM. If that drops down immediately to a 15% PRM, then, then the system isn't going to need that delta that was built up between, uh, you know, between the 15 and the 22.5. And so the gas is the first thing to go uh, when, when that, um, in order to right size the, the portfolio. Thanks, James. I'll also add that I don't think it's really our projection, but we don't really comment on this, the ruling um, or expectation that um, the PRM would um, jump back down that far um, towards the end of the decade. Um, but we did want to show what would happen in the analysis if you submitted it. Exactly. So from Ed Snellop, two-part question. The trajectory of procurement of the new resources is different in the PSP scenario from the procurement scenario as modeled by the CEC in their midterm reliability assessment that they showed on Monday. Which scenario more accurately reflects LSE plan? Hmm. Uh, I would say both do, and we worked uh, pretty closely with the CEC uh, in, in, in alignment on, on there. One, one th I think what the, what the difference uh, that you might be observing is that there is a difference in the portfolio numbers in there presentation on Monday versus um, what's in the ruling and was presented here. Some resources were in the resolved portfolios and they're part of the uh, proposed PSP that were actually included in, in the baseline. They are, they are baseline resources, but they were taken out of the baseline and inserted into, into, the, um, into the planned resource category because they were not part of the CAISO transmission baseline. So when we submit these portfolios to the CAISO for transmission planning, we want them to look at uh, resources that are uh, incremental to, to their transmission baseline. Uh, and so while some resources actually met our definition of baseline in that they uh, were, were contracted or the LSE had a contract for them um, as of June 30th, 2020, um, they still do appear in the in the portfolio. So to the extent that the numbers presented here are a little bit bigger than uh, the CEC uh, PSP numbers, that's that's the difference. Thanks, James. There's also a second part to Ed's question, which I think we can handle quickly. The PSP assumes incremental NQC of uh, 2,753 megawatts in 2022. Does commission staff believe this amount to be realistic for 2022? Um, Ed, it's a good question. Um, there's probably differing opinions here. We know that there's a bunch of different call and procurement tracks or activities in flight already. IRP is only one of them that would result in new NQC for next year. But if you feel like this number is too high or too low, um, please do let us know in your comments and maybe we can work with that um, for um, the next steps of this analysis. Um, we do have quite a few more questions here, um, and I know we're already kind of uh, blowing past time, so I'm going to try to deal with one more. Um, and then the rest we might actually have to kind of put in the queue and catch back up um, later on in the presentation. From Steve Metigu, slide 27 shows the 38 MMT core requires very little upgrades to transmission through 2032. Can you explain when the PUC plans to build the needed transmission into location constrained urban load centers to eventually retire the gas generation um, used in those urban areas? Steve, it's a good question, but it's tough. Um, the analysis that you see here is um, trying to tackle a, a more limited set of questions. Um, I think there's an assumption built into your question that it's transmission that will solve some of the local area constraints and emission constraints that you're referring to. Um, we do intend to do more analysis to and hopefully develop tools that can look at uh, kind of more geographic granular pictures um, to start telling local reliability and local uh, emissions uh, stories soon. Uh, but we appreciate the question. And with that, I think maybe we should um, kick off firms production cost modeling section. And I'll just note um, that Deborah Bayless has the next question up. Sorry, Deborah, but we're going to have to get back to you a little bit later.
So Munir Donald. Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Donald Brooks. Uh, I uh, am from the Energy Resource Modeling Team, uh, and Munir Salahi on my team. Uh, likewise, um, uh, I would. Uh, so Munir is going to run through a bunch of slides talking about the uh, production cost modeling study uh, that we ran. Uh, we ran both the LSE plans and the 38 MMT core uh, case. And uh, take it away, Munir. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks, Donald. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Munir Lahi from the uh, UC, uh, CPUC Energy Division. Uh, I'll, in the next 45 minutes or so, I will be presenting the production cost model analysis. Next slide, please. So where is outline? So uh, the, the presentation is uh, basically defined to roughly uh, four sections. The first section will uh, we'll talk about some background and some summary results for both portfolios. And uh, the next section will dive deep in the uh, uh, aggregated load serving entity portfolio. Uh, and the third section will talk about the 38 MMT core portfolio and the three sensitivities we run. And then we finish with some conclusion and uh, the next steps. The next slide, please. Uh, here is some background. Uh, uh, James uh, talk up, uh, he defined most of it in previous uh, presentation. So, uh, like uh, James mentioned, a uh, lot of entities uh, submitted their IRP plans for in September 2020. Then um, the CPUC uh, staff aggregated those uh, of uh, the lot of entity uh, uh, filing uh, into two portfolios, the 46 uh, MMT and 38 MMT. Wow. And then, uh, and then we uh, CPC staff run the production cost model to uh, validate the reliability for the this portfolio and uh, study the greenhouse emission. Uh, and and then uh, the like I said, there's three section and the third one we're going to be talking about the model of the energy core portfolio and this. Uh, Portfolio uh, uh, is basically like Jim said is uh, the uh, is the aggregated uh, 38 MMT lot serving entity uh, plans plus the MTR or the midterm reliability plus the new build from resolve, and we did the same thing. We run this portfolio through the production cost model to test the reliability of the portfolio and uh, study the green uh, DHC emission. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this slide summarizes uh, the results for both portfolios. Uh, uh, staff found that the aggregated uh, lot serving entity plans was not reliable in both scenarios, 48, 46 and 38 MMT in both years. Uh, we modeled them for 2030 and 26 because the loss of load was, uh, was higher than 0.1. And also, those uh, portfolios did not meet the green DJC uh, targets. That's why uh, our staff recommended that more renewables and more reliability capacity is needed to make uh, this portfolio more reliable and uh, more cleaner. And uh, for the 38 MT Corp, uh, before, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, for the uh, uh, energy core portfolio and sensitivities, the result was a little better. So we, uh, this portfolio, they were reliable. Uh, all of them, they were uh, the 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 loss of uh, the loss of in all of them was below 0 0.1, and they showed that the the JC uh, target was significantly lower compared to uh, the aggregate lot serving entity plans. The next one, please. Uh, one more. So yeah, in this section, we uh, this is the second section, and where we're going to be talking about the uh, aggregate load serving entity plans. 
So uh, as a starting point, staff start with the PSM baseline and the electric demand input that was used in the transmission planning uh, process CTP that was sent to uh, to, uh, to Kaiso for their 21-22 TPP process. <laughs> More information uh, about TPP process can be found in uh, CPUC ruling from October 2020. Uh, then staff uh, updated the the baseline with the new research that came online because uh, when we run TPP, some research they were not online, so we update them and then we, uh, we replace the resolve uh, new bit capacity in TPP with the capacity from the uh, uh, from not seven entity uh, filing. And the OAN constructed the 46 and 38 MMT. So this process uh, were applied to both 38 and 46 MMT portfolios for uh, both years 26 and 23. Next slide, please. Yeah, this slide just reinforced what was stated in the previous one. So the main thing is like the baseline was updated to include the resources that came online since CPP and uh, the capacity, uh, the old capacity or new bit for capacity resolve recommended for TPP was replaced by the uh, the, the aggregated lot of entity plans for both years uh, for both in and for six and for uh, and to the eight in both years. 26 and 23. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, in this graph, let me see, let's make it bigger. So, uh, so this graph is just uh, is comparing the capacity be, uh, for uh, between two scenarios uh, to the 8 MT and for uh, uh, and for 6 MT. So, uh, the y axis is the capacity in megawatt hour. The bottom axis is showing the unit category or the research types. Uh, the, uh, the gray bar is the 46 MMT for 26, and the blue bar is 38 MMT for 26. The yellow bar is the 46 MMT portfolio for 2030. The orange, uh, the orange bar is 38 MMT portfolio for 2030. So just uh, like you see in the graph, there's three uh, arrows pointing. So that show just to show you the difference in capacity between the uh, 46 MMT portfolio and 38 MMT portfolio in year 2030. So the three main one is uh, the battery storage. Uh, the 38 MMT in 2030 has uh, 20, uh, 244 megawatt extra compared to 46 MMT. Uh, in, and the solar has, uh, the solar in 38 MMT has about 2100 megawatt extra compared to 46 MMT. And the wind has about 1700 megawatt, uh, 1700 megawatt extra from per, uh, in 38 compared to 46 in, 20, in 23. Next one, please. Yeah. So uh, this uh, slide showing the reliability, uh, reliability metrics we use in production cost model server to assess if the system is reliable or not. There is different metrics we use. There is lots of load. There is lots of load hour expected and uh, uh, unserved energy or EUE. And the right uh, the right side of the reliability uh, metric column we have. We're showing you the the four uh, the four uh, uh, two scenarios: 46 MMT and 38 MMT for both years 26 and 23. So we just like we uh, the main metric we use to assess reliability is the loss of load, and the criteria is if the loss of load is greater than 0 0.1, we conclude that the system is not reliable. If it's less than 0 0.1, we conclude the system is reliable. As you see in the uh, highlighted uh, uh, red, num uh, red numbers, 
uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the portfolio for six MMT in 26, the loss of load is 0 0.36, and 23 is 0 0.68, and uh, 38 MMT uh, portfolio uh, in 26, the loss of load is 0 0.29. And in 2020, it's 0, uh, 0, uh, 0 0.41. And all of them, all, all, all of them exceed 0 0.1. So that's why we concluded that the, uh, the aggregate low sediment entity plants uh, are not reliable in both scenarios and in both years. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this slide, uh, Shows the uh, energy generation of, uh, in yeah from the production cost uh, model seven for both scenarios 46 MMT and 38 MMT in both years. So uh, the first column is described in the resource type and the unit we are using here in the gigawatt hours. So we can uh, in like in 46 MMT. We can see uh, uh, for six and two. We can see that CC uh, uh, in 2030 there were more CC more CC generation compared to 26, and in 26 we see the opposite trend. We see more CCs in two, uh, in um, 26, but less CCs in uh, 2030. In terms of the picker, they were the same trend. If you look at the picker, there were less pickers in 26. In both scenarios, 38 and 46 MMT, uh, but like we started dispatching more pickers in uh, 2030 in both scenarios in uh, 46 scenario and 38 MMT, uh, 38 MMT scenarios. Uh, for the renewables, as expected, we see that the behind the meter PV, uh, we can see there is more in 2030 in both scenarios compared to 26. The same can be said for for solar and for wind. Yeah, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, this uh, slide uh, shows the servum annual uh, GHG emission result. So, the, uh, again, so in the first column is just like some accounting we do to, uh, to calculate the GHG emission. And uh, the second, third, and fourth column are just showing the the uh, lot seven entities portfolios to for six and to eight by year to six and to three. So the four, we can just here focus on the the bottom the bottom row, and that shows how much each scenario by year emitted. So for four six and in two to six, we see that the emission was. Uh, uh, for uh, 40.8 MMT in 2030, 47, for, uh, 40.7 in 26, for uh, uh, 38 MMT uh, MM scenario in 26 is 40.1, and in 2030 it's 36.7. And those numbers that didn't meet the target, even if we need to see 46 MMT or 38 MMT, those are for California. So we need to prorate TISO. So the, they didn't meet the share of the case. So in uh, the 46 MMT exceeded the target by 2.5 MMT in 2030, and the 38 MMT in 2030 exceeded the target by 5.5. So the main takeaway here: the both scenarios in both years did not meet the target. Next slide, please. So uh, yeah, this is uh, just a conclusion to, uh, so the main takeaway from this section are the following. The 46 and 38 MMT uh, load serving entity aggregate plants are not reliable by themselves because the loss of load are greater than 0 0.1 in all studies in all years. Also the, the portfolios did not meet the GC target in either for six MMT or the right MMT cases. So uh, that's why staff recommended adding more renewable and uh, 
derived the capacity to create another portfolio. We call it 38 MMT core portfolio, and that's the portfolio we'll be looking at and then extraction. Can, uh, next slide, please. So this is the section when we're going to talk about the 38 MMT core portfolio and the three sensitivities we're on. The next one. So to remind everyone again, uh, the 38 MMT core portfolio is the existing baseline like is the same baseline we use for the load serving uh, entities uh, the aggregated load serving entity portfolio plus the aggregated 38 mmt load serving entities plans plus the mtr reliability procurement plus re uh, re uh, new bit from results that's how we define and that's how we develop the 38 mmt core portfolio for both years for 26 and for 23. In addition uh, I'm to gonna that, jump, can I jump in here? I'm going to jump in here and try to clarify a point here that the uh, uh, MTR, uh, the midterm reliability procurement and result resource additions were kind of uh, both kind of mixed up in, or uh, they weren't uh, uh, totally you know, it wasn't like there was 11 and a half megawatts of MTR and then additional uh, resolve stuff on top of that. Uh, those were kind of, uh, you know, incremental uh, amounts uh, meant to achieve the reliability and GHG goals. Um, and uh, all of this was sort of on top of uh, the uh, 38 MMT plans uh, that we've already uh, sort of discussed earlier. Um, this is how this was sort of put into the servo model uh, through uh, um, a lot of reconciliation with uh, the result model, the MTR uh, procurement uh, uh, information, and, uh, you know, the, the rest of the IRP team. So I just wanted to clarify that while I had the opportunity. Okay, thanks, Dawa. That was for the uh, 38 MMT core portfolio. And then we also, in this study, we run three sensitivities, one for ge uh, geothermal, the other ones are pump storage, and the third one is battery storage. So what we did in this is there was a procurement supposed to happen in 20, uh, supposed to be in 28. We moved those resources two years back from 28 to uh, 26 and we're on sensitivity. So, for example, we're after, we're, uh, we moved the capacity, uh, geothermal capacity that was supposed to procure in 28 to 26 and holding everything as constant. And we did the same thing for pump storage. We hold everything constant and we moved the capacity that was supposed to be procured in 28 to 26 and we did the same thing for battery storage. Next slide, please. So there here are some uh, modeling conventions uh, that's uh, worth mentioning. So uh, the production cost model seven so far it does not capture the climate change, uh, change impact and the dispatch uh, report we have. So uh, so far in, in, in terms of hydro we we model only the years from for, from 1998 to 2017. And that means we're not capturing the recent drought in the model. So, and there's another thing can, you know, the the climate change can have an impact on the reliability, and that's the model is not capturing so far. So that was true for both portfolios for the 38 MMT core and uh, the aggregate loss serving entity portfolios. Uh, other, uh, uh, the other. Uh, Assumption we modified is like the the import restriction. We restricted the 38 MT core more than the uh, the aggregate loss serving MT portfolio. In the 38 MT core, the, we restricted the import to four four thousand megawatt in uh, uh, from June to uh, through September. Uh, and uh, aggregate uh, aggregate load serving entity portfolio, the import were about uh, five five thousand megawatt from July to September, and also we uh, in uh, trading MMT core we uh, restricted the reserve requirement. 
to you know to trigger the loss of load events. And, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this uh, graph is uh, comparing the uh, the the load serving entities plus versus the MMT core in 2030. So um, the bottom again is uh, uh, is the resource type or the energy category and or technology, if you will. And uh, and the, uh, at the y-axis we have the capacity in megawatt hours. So. Uh, yeah, so the orange bar is the 38 MMT core, and the uh, blue bar is 38 MMT low serving entity plant. So uh, maybe you're not going to see it because uh, the graph is smaller, but this graph is showing that there is like 47% uh, percent extra battery storage in 38 MMT com uh, cores compared to 38 MMT. From the low, the low severity plants, and we have about four, uh, four to six percent extra in geothermal, and geothermal where is right here. It's more you cannot see. And then we have thirty six extra in pump storage and twenty one uh, percent in DR. We have slight increase in both in solar and wind, and also we're tired about like nine hundred fifty megawatt thermal. Cogen and series. The next slide. Yeah, so, uh, this graph is comparing the generation uh, between a resolve and servum. So the first column is the technology and the units were used to compare the generation is gigawatt hours. The first, second, third column shows the comparison between resolve and servum in both years, 26 and 23. So, uh, I think the main takeaway from here is that the servum produced similar amount or almost roughly the same as the resolve. And you can see it here, like the hand meter is almost about the same in 23. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, unit solar is about the same. Same thing can say about the, the wind, but servant produces more GHG emission than resolve, and also exported more, exported more than resolve uh, and import less. So we can say that servant produces about 9% more in carbon generation than resolve, but lower the net import to about uh, Disney about, to about like 4% in the net energy for KISO. Uh, then yeah, we're, we're we're looking into uh, more about this to find out uh, what we can gain from this and whether this uh, effect is real and what or or just uh, or something is wrong with our dispatch. We're just going to spend more time thinking about uh, you know digging into this uh, just to uh, really try to understand the difference in GHG emissions between uh, resolve and serum. So uh, this is uh, some of what we found so far, and uh, you know showing some of the uh, things that are different or things that are similar or different. Thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, yeah this slide also show, com uh, com uh, comparing the reliable, uh, showing us the reliability metrics we use and also showing the JSC, uh metrics. So again, when in Servum, we mainly we have different metrics to assess the reliability, like I said before, loss of load, loss of load hour, AUEs, and uh, here we also we always focus on or it just it is, we focus on the loss of load to assess the reliability. We are uh, in like 28 MMT in 2030. You see that the loss of load is 0 0.054, and in 26 is, uh, is 0 0.064. Those both numbers are lower than 0 0.1, which leads us to conclude that the 38 MT core portfolio in both years is reliable. And at the bottom, also showing you the JC. Um, so you see, like in, in 2030, it's 34.6, and in 26, uh, in 26, it's 38.14. And those numbers are lower than what we showed in the previous section. When we showed you the GHC from the aggregated loss serving entity portfolios. Next slide. 
So yeah, this uh, graph is comparing the CO2 emission between resolve and uh, servum. The red bar is uh, represent the resolve. The green bar, the blue bar represents servum, and you see that servum emit more than resolve in 26. It, it emit about like 1.5 mmt more than resolve, and in 2030 it emitted about 3.5 mmt more than resolve. Uh, next slide. So this uh, this slide is uh, showing the loss of load or the reliability for the four uh, st uh, portfolios we run for the core case. The most reliable one is this, the geothermal. And by the way, this one is just for, we run the sensitivity only for 26. So if you, look, if you start looking at the graph from the right side, the left side, you see the geothermal case is the more reliable one. The loss of load was 0 0.019, followed by pump storage hydro, followed by the batteries, and then the core case. The next slide. Yeah, this graph is uh, comparing the GHC across the all core cases. So uh, again, the geothermal show, shows uh, is the more the most cleaner compared to the uh, the pump storage and batteries and core, followed by pump storage, then batteries, and then the core cases. Okay, next slide. Uh, well, when I when I showed you the uh, the table for the reliability, I showed you the AUE for the annual, uh, the annual AUE, and this one a heat map showing you the AUE by month. If you look at the bottom, you see the the, the or the X axis, the, you see the month from January to December, and the Y axis is the hour. So the the, the darker blue is the higher the number. So we can see uh, before we used to see the AOE okay, happen between July and September. We still see it here, but also now we start seeing that there's some AOE even is. And, and it is not significant. We can start seeing it in, in non peak hours and non peak months. You can see there is some EOE in February, in March, and May, in like between in 9 uh, or 10 a.m. in the morning. So, yeah, the next slide, please. I'll, I'll just uh, stop there for a yeah. second. Someone had a question about which uh, or what we mean when we say operational issues or operational uh, constraints. Some of what we're talking about is uh, this uh, uh, effect here. Again, we're going to make sure that it's real, make sure that uh, this is an accurate finding uh, by digging in uh, to our results more. Uh, but it does uh, just uh, uh, tell, uh, you know, lead us to question whether uh, some uh, of the expected unserved energy is going to be uh, maybe caused by some uh, ramping or operational issues uh, with uh, capacity and not just uh, sufficient or enough capacity. That would be something you would see in the spring in the morning. So that's kind of what we mean when we say uh, certain that, that there's a, that, that maybe there's some oper operational challenges. That's what we mean by that. All right, thanks. So uh, this, uh, uh, I think, this is the last slide before we uh, the conclusion. And this one is this slide is comparing the. Uh, California criteria pollutants. We compare seven mix to car projections. So the first column shows you what uh, what uh, pollutant we're using. We're using the NOx, SOx, and the PM. And then uh, the following columns is showing the uh, the car uh, the car projects uh, projects in, in 26 and 2030. Then and server mix in 2030. And the last two column is showing the delta between the two uh, projections. So uh, the, the negative values at the last two columns means that server pollutes less. So meaning that server uh, mix is cleaner than NOx, uh, than, sorry, than uh, the, the car projection in both years, 26 and 20, uh, 26 and 23, and that's probably 
We don't know maybe because some of the uh, the cleaner resource mix may be driven by the CPUC and low fermentation actions, or some may be driven by non kaiso resource mix with change in the baseline or portfolio. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, conclude the. So this is the last slide we have here, and that again the main takeaway from this section, from section the third section, are the following. The loss of load is below 0 0.1 in the uh, in, for the 38 MMT core portfolio and for the sensitivity. Also, the the four uh, run we run like the 38 MMT core portfolio and the three sensitivity, they were the lower uh, they show a lower GAC compared to the aggregate loss seven entities. Yeah, and the last about is, is just like about the next step. So some of the the data we uh, we presented is going to be posted on CPC uh, well, website. Also, we're going to continue to analyze PSP after we receive the party comments and we implement uh, the 2020 IPAR. So uh, thanks for listening. And then if you have any question now, we'll try to answer them. Yeah, I'll I'll uh I know that you will have asked this question, so I'll uh pre answer this one. The operational data is going to be hourly uh hourly dispatch reports, uh hourly dispatch data uh for um the the highest EUE cases uh that we produced uh in our production cost model. The uh hourly dispatch uh results will include uh generation by resource type aggregated by resource type. Uh, going to avoid publishing uh, unit specific data as well as uh, electric demand uh, and um, uh, reserve uh, requirements, reserves provided, and reserves shortages so that people can really see uh, where uh, reserves came into play. Uh, you know, the different uh, um, reserves came into play in how uh, um, the model dispatch things um, just. Uh, we're not going to show uh, too much about the prices, but we're going to show uh, uh, how the hourly uh, generation levels uh, move, you know, uh, uh, happened uh, uh, across the various years. Donald, it's Nathan. That's, that's really helpful. Um, what you'll see, Donald, in your My Q&A section um, that you've probably yeah. already been responding to, um, are several yeah, requests, one which I think you just, yeah. yeah, we appreciate that. Um, I think you just addressed um, a couple of them with your sponsor, basically what supplemental information can parties expect to see and when um, regarding case results. Uh -huh. And then if you wouldn't mind just going through the other questions um, in your Q&A column that haven't been addressed yet, right. um, in the, over the sure. next couple of minutes, it would be very helpful. Uh, hybrids are uh, batteries and storage. Uh, and hybrids mostly came from LSE plans. Uh, the uh, um, uh, resolve additional uh, capacity uh, didn't uh, necess didn't produce hybrids. Uh, you know, additional hybrid uh, uh, storage uh, and solar generators. But yeah, it was all four-hour batteries and uh, solar of various ratios uh, between the batteries and the solar capacity, and that was uh, what. Uh, and that was based on the LSE plans. Uh, generation levels differ between uh, Resolve and Servum. Uh, there is likely to be uh, some differences between uh, solar and wind generation because we're using a, uh, uh, a distribution of weather years, um, but uh, we are making efforts uh, to be closer and closer and closer uh, between the two models and uh, it does look like uh, we'll continue uh, to evaluate uh, just the differences between uh, the, the, the the wind and solar shapes between uh, resolve and forward going forward, uh, resolve and serving going forward. That seems like uh, something to be uh, continue to be uh, to be looked at. Uh, we'll have process with the PUCU to develop planning standards and requirements for LSEs regarding the impact of uh, climate change stuff like drought uh, on emissions and reliability. Has hydro availability been modeled stochastically 
in the uh, LOE modeling? And if not, when will it be uh, incorporated? So um, uh, the hydro uh, availability uh, is based on weather and the hydro availability uh, is based on yeah, the amount of hydro available in a given month and year, uh, in a given month and you know weather year uh, is correlated to the same weather year that we use for electric demand and wind uh, and solar, which for the time being is 1998 through 2017. Uh, we will update to more, uh, you know, th uh, current weather years uh, when we uh, begin the next bunch of updates uh, for the next reference system plan. But for right now, we're just uh, finishing out the process with uh, these inputs that we developed uh, at the beginning of this uh, IRP cycle. Let's see. Uh, so I think I've answered the uh, information uh, question about operational and loss of load data. It's like I said, just the hourly uh, dispatch of, of different resource types, uh, 8760 throughout the year, showing uh, what generation is there, uh, what the reserve requirements are, what the reserves provided are. Uh, the generation will be aggregated by resource type, uh, including when batteries are charging, when batteries are uh, um, uh, discharging. And, uh, you know, so that we can see uh, what in an 8760, what, uh, what, what everything's doing to add up to uh, the, the, the totals we see. Uh, a, yeah, a very good question um, about uh, climate change and its effect on future. Um, we uh, have not uh, uh, put out much of a public process yet about how to really make forecasts of uh, hydro generation and electric demands that reflect the uh, probably what's going to happen in the future instead of what we know did happen in the past because the uh, what we think is going to happen in the future uh, is starting to not uh, be found in the historical record uh, more and more often. Um, so uh, that is um, a big concern for us and that is uh, a new challenge that I think uh, uh, that just personally, I think, explains a lot of the uh, um, uh, real sort of um, uh, issues we're having uh, right now uh, with regards uh, low hydro and uh, you know, some of the issues we have right now. Well, that's a good point, and I think it kind of gets to um, Julia Levin's question that just came in, um, which is basically on, on similar material of, you know, how um, is servo modeling taking into account uh, possible changes and assumptions um, as it relates to hydro or any climate impacts included in the assessment of operational constraints, such as impacts of extreme heat, more variable winds, increasing mm -hmm. wildfire impacts, et cetera. Um, I imagine your answer is that they partially are, but what you just spoke to is the need for us to have a broader, probably cross-agency process without developing assumptions for that sort of thing. Is that right? Well, yeah. Uh, the uh, um, uh, Generally, uh, uh, inputs for these types of models are drawn from uh, this, uh, distributions of historical events, and the reason for that is uh, at least up until recently, the effort was to ensure that, uh, you know, just what happens if heat waves in the past uh, occur in a particular future year, you know, that the uh, variability of, of the historical record was, was, was going to represent the full distribution of the variability we were likely to see in the future. And that uh, um, is increasingly not, not, not guaranteed anymore. And so uh, just, you know, a challenge that I would like to put out there is just using, uh, yes, uh, um, a challenge is going to be uh, developing enough uh, distribution of data in order to study different uh, scenarios of weather and different scenarios of, of uh, the future electric demand when, uh, when we don't have as much historical record of it occurring. Um, you know. Yeah, good points, Donald. Um, and it runs um, as a kind of interesting, um, I guess, counterpoint to some of the other questions that we're getting in the Q&A window um, regarding um, given CEC's results from um, that they workshopped on Monday morning and your loss of load results now that show us in some cases um, pretty comfortably below um, 0.1 loss of load standard um, in the years we modeled, mm -hmm. does, that, does that mean um, that we're, we um, are engaging in what some are terming over procurement? Um, and I think that um, that's a strong term to use um, and is also 
possibly kind of reflective of, um, you know, how much should we be have been baking in these possible needs to change our assumptions, particularly about weather related things and their effects on the electricity system, um, all as back as far as the MTR decision itself, i.e., um, could we see or interpret the um, that buffer below 0.1 loss of load that we're seeing in the CDC's results and our results as something like uh, headroom or a um, cushion against um, some of the other stuff that we might not be capturing in the model yet, but are kind of committing to try to improve on here. Does that make sense, Donald? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, to explain uh, some of the differences in the different visions of reliability in the future that we're looking at. And just Nathan, a quick note on housekeeping. Nathan, sorry, Nathan. could you take a pause and see if Commissioner Sharoma, Commissioner Gunda, Commissioner Halk have any questions at this point? Of course. This is Genevieve. I don't have any questions, but I'm just very impressed with the sheer amount of work that has gone into this analysis and all of the various uh, sensitivity analyses. And, and I very much appreciate the answers to the questions in the Q&A. Thank you. And Nathan, could you all, I, I, I want to see if Commissioner Gunda has any questions. Um, thank you, Commissioner Akshat. And uh, I, I have just uh, one question and I think I, Again, uh, before I jump into the question, just uh, repeating uh, what Commissioner Shiroma just said, this is extremely impressive work. Um, a lot of lot of detail here to digest. Um, wanted to just uh, go to slide number 50 um, on the uh, aggregated LSD plants versus the 38 MMT core. I um, just wanted to understand uh, that this this kind of chart is showing uh, the totality of all the resources or just the additions or are a hybrid? This is totality of everything. Okay. Um, thank you. So, so then just a, a quick uh, kind of uh, a sentiment that I think came up in the CEC's analysis of the workshop on Monday. Um, could, could this be read as, uh, you know, as we think through um, both ensuring reliability, but also uh, reducing the emissions to meet uh, the 38 MMT because the LSE plants, as you noted earlier, are slightly higher than that. Um, that essentially we are having a storage pick up the, what I've, I've observed as um, the LOLE events are happening primarily in the uh, net peak hour. So the, the storage is really playing a significant role um, and, and you know, higher additions compared to uh, the direct reduction in the thermal fleet. Is that an accurate way to read this? Uh, yeah, the the battery storage is definitely picking up a lot of the uh, uh, picking up a lot of the responsibility for mitigating the loss of load events um, there. Uh, uh, yes, uh, but the amount of batteries that were added uh, do exceed the amount of uh, thermal that is retired, which. Uh, Still makes it clear, uh, um, you know, that the uh, um, comparative value of storage is still, uh, you know, uh, maybe not, uh, you know, one to one just yet. Got it. Um, uh, just, uh, just one other uh, kind of uh, question at a high level. Um, I think Donald, you you briefly um, mentioned some insights on the. Uh, and slide number 56, uh, which I think is extremely helpful um, heat map moving forward in our, as we have, we see more electrification and seasonal changes. Um, the, the February and March and April events in the early um, day, what, what is that being triggered by? What, what is the combination there, do you think? Uh, um, I'm imagining that there's some, uh, uh, restrictions on how fast or ramping on thermal plants uh, to uh, account for the fact that this is when uh, probably the, I'm guessing, you know, I, 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 I need to study this more to find out uh, 
for sure what this is happening uh, here, but uh, this is also the period when uh, solar begins to ramp up uh, significantly uh, and uh, the electric demand uh, uh, is, is, is uh, not ramping up to quite the same level. And so uh, uh, this may be either uh, some uncertainty about uh, solar ramping up uh, or it's some uncertainty about the capabilities of, of, of other uh, types of generators in the fleet to really uh, um, come down or, or, or uh, account for what the solar is doing. That's, that, that's my intuition, but we need to uh, dig into it more to figure out uh, what, what really, you know, whether this is uh, an issue or not, uh, you know, really measurable. Keep, you know, keep in mind that uh, at this point the uh, numbers are uh, really small uh, compared to uh, what's happening uh, in, in that peak period. Thanks, uh, Donald. Just uh, one last uh, quick thread here. Um, one of the limitations of the CEC's analysis that was described on Monday uh, was we uh, CEC uh, has not looked at uh, the resource sufficiency to be able to charge the batteries under uh, potential conditions of import limitations or um, other issues uh, that might creep up. Um, are, are, are you beginning to look at it or are you thinking about how best to model uh, those as we move forward? Uh, um, yes, we, 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 we definitely need to, we are, we are intending to look more into uh, just the way, just, just uh, the way that uh, storage uh, plays or works with uh, everything else in the fleet. Thank you, Donald. No more questions from me. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Well, thank just you. Just one last, just one. Nathan, would you be kind enough to explain how we're answering all the questions in the Q and A? Some of which are not being answered verbally; others being written, so everyone uh, understands the pro your process. For sure, Rex Shelton. That's exactly what I was about to do. So thanks for the prompt. Um, so a lot of you have noticed that um, the use of the new Q&A tool has kind of allowed us um, a new function, a new way of um, engaging with stakeholders mid-workshop. Um, so while at the beginning of this meeting and during that first Q&A, we tried to answer all uh, questions verbally, um, we realized that to stay within our time constraints, we might actually have to employ the Q&A tool a little bit more rigorously. Um, so what a lot of you are seeing, especially those asking questions, um, is us kind of individually answering questions in the Q&A function, um, basically via text and not addressing them verbally. Um, but we still want to provide a level of visibility um, into everyone's questions. So what we're also seeking to do here um, is pull down all of the Q&A um, text and have it available publicly um, after the meeting, um, probably around when we post the workshop recording. Um, so um, thanks for bearing with us. Um, we actually think that this might be a slightly more efficient way to get through um, questions during um, a workshop, but we'll also be um, open to feedback on the process um, after um, everything's done. Thank you, Dr. Commissioner. Thank you very much, Nathan. And then while we're on housekeeping, um, I don't see any more unanswered questions in the queue. Um, James, should we? think about a break? Uh, yeah, this is uh, actually the scheduled break time uh, for this workshop. So why don't we all reconvene at 310? Excellent, 310 on the dot. All right, thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. See you in 15 minutes on the dot.
All right, everyone. Uh, it is 310. Welcome back uh, to the second half of the IRP preferred system plan workshop. Uh, so the first half was a very technical modeling heavy presentations. Uh, in this half of the workshop, we will go over uh, the transmission of resource portfolios uh, to the CAISO for the transmission planning process. And that will be led by Carolina Maslanka. And then we will have a uh, discussion of the various procurement and other CPC action related items that are teed up in the ruling. So uh, with that, I will hand it to Carolina to discuss TPP. Thanks, James. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so in this section, I'll present what the ruling proposes in terms of how the PSP research portfolios should inform CAISO's next transmission planning process. That's the 2022-2023 TPP. Next slide. So first, I want to provide a quick overview of the interaction between IRP and TPP. The two top boxes depict how information flows between the CPUC's IRP process and the CAISO's TPP. Every year, the CPUC passes at least one resource portfolio to CAISO as an input to the TPP, which plans 10 years out. The key portfolio is the reliability and policy-driven base case portfolio. Transmission solutions identified um, by CAISO in the assessments using this base case portfolio go to the CAISO Board of Governors for approval. Specifically, if a TPP policy-driven assessment identifies the need for transmission upgrades, that need would be driven directly by the resource portfolios, their composition, and where we are um, planning for these resources to come online. And the CPUC typically also transfers to CAISO a policy-driven sensitivity portfolio or portfolios. And these are studied for information-only purposes and typically do not result in any transmission approval. Um, but before the CPUC can get to a place where we can pass a portfolio to the CAISO, we have to go through a few steps, including running resolves to develop the portfolios. Uh, and one important input into the resolve model is information regarding transmission limits and upgrade costs. CAISO passes this input to the CPUC, and this information flow is depicted with the bottom box. Next slide. So I want to hit on only a couple of points here. Uh, the base case portfolio is used for all three assessments, the reliability, uh, the policy-driven assessment, and the economic assessment. And as I said earlier, it goes to the Board of Governors for approval. Uh, the sensitivity portfolio is used for policy-driven assessments, and, um, and it can also be used for economic assessments. And as I stated earlier, it's information only. Next slide. For the 2022-2023 TPP, the CPUC aims to transfer research portfolios to the CAISO by February 2022 to ensure that CAISO can stay on schedule. Uh, the pre preliminary policy-driven study results should be made available by the CAISO in mid-November 2022, and the final policy-driven study results should be made available in February 2023. Uh, so what does this mean for our process? Uh, these TPP results could inform development of the next IRP preferred system plan in 2023. Since, reference, uh, since the reference system plan work will begin in early 2022, and the TPP results will not be available until the end of 2022, it's unlikely that these results will inform the RSP or any work in 2022. Uh, the TPP results could also inform future procurement actions. Uh, understanding the transmission implications of a specific resource build out allows the CPUC to make more informed decisions when providing um, planning guidance to LSEs or issuing a procurement order. So that's another important aspect of these results. Uh, so we received a lot of excellent feedback from parties last year on how to improve resolve and bus bar mapping. And considering this and the fact that CAISO is now implementing a new deliverability methodology that impacts transmission limits, um, staff prioritized improving alignment with CAISO's findings. So in this section, I'll provide an overview of how we improve the representation of transmission and resolve. Next. 
The objective of IRP modeling, as most of in the audience will know, is to develop an optimal portfolio of new resources to add to the existing case of weight. And it's important that the composition of the portfolio accomplishes a number of things, including uh, keeping costs reasonable. So Resolve accounts for the cost of new transmission when optimizing for a least cost portfolio. Typically, if candidate resources can fit on the existing transmission system, Resolve will select to do so because it will be the least cost option. Resolve results 10 years out serve as an indication of where transmission upgrades may be needed to accommodate resource needs. However, the indicative transmission upgrade information requires additional analysis to determine if the indicated transmission upgrades are in fact necessary. And this analysis is done through two processes. First, the mapping of all selected resources to specific bus bars, and then the KISO's TPP process. So to improve the accuracy of the transmission indications provided by Resolve, and to allow for more alignment between Resolve, the bus bar mapping process, and KISO's TPP assessments, updates were made to Resolve. Uh, so these upgrades included a number of things. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, so moving across the top, first a code base update was made and this allowed for the implementation of the remaining improvements. Next, limiting a uh, transmission build and resolve to the KISO determined levels was an important improvement. Uh, previously, resolve assumed that the same transmission upgrade could be implemented multiple times at the same cost and that each subsequent implementation of the same upgrade would increase capacity by the same amount. And this is not a realistic representation of what is possible. Next, solar zones were consolidated from 22 zones down to nine zones, while batteries, instead of being selected by resolve without any indication of location, are now selected in one of 10 zones. And these two changes allow resolve to provide us with a better indication of the value of co-located solar plus storage, and also allow the model to account for the amount of available on-peak transmission capability that storage uses or by how much it expands off-peak transmission capability through charging. Importantly, one of the biggest changes to resolve was moving from transmission limits developed using um, the old KISO deliverability methodology based on nameplate capacity, uh, so regardless of, of resource type, to uh, transmission limits based on the new KISO deliverability methodology, which accounts for resource type specific output assumptions. Additionally, on the bottom left, uh, you will see that pump storage is now included in the deliverability constraints. This is accomplished by assuming specific locations for pump storage and resolve. And finally, the external zone of formulation. Previously, there were areas with renewable resource potential that were not covered by KISO's transmission constraint information. In the past, these were incorporated into resolve as external zones. The updated KISO transmission constraint information now covers these regions. So these areas were incorporated into existing zones or into new resource zones as part of this resolve update. Next slide. This slide provides a link to the new KISO transmission limits that we incorporated into resolve. The main thing that I want to note here is that the new transmission limits generally increase the amount of available capacity on the transmission system relative to the 2019 KISO white paper values. But there are um, a few areas in which the limits did actually decrease significantly. The new limits also include geographic areas, like I noted earlier, that were not covered in the 2019 white paper. Next. Um, as I noted a couple of slides back, staff focused on improving the modeling of solar and storage and the interaction between the two in Resolve. Staff also improved how Resolve accounts for the extent to which storage and solar resources use up existing transmission headroom. Next slide. 
So using the improved resolve model, we were able to develop resource portfolios and James already provided an overview of the sensitivities that staff ran and the PSP portfolio. So in this section, I'll speak to which of these portfolios the ruling proposes the CPC transmits to CAISO by February 2022. Next slide. Thank you. As a reminder, the base case is important because it is used as an input to reliability assessment, assessments, which um, the CAISO uses to do a number of things. Um, first, to identify the facilities with thermal overloads and voltage concerns and stability concerns, also to ensure that NERC standards are met. And additionally, the policy-driven base case is used to plan for policy goals that may drive the need for new transmission. The, the base case portfolio that uh, the CPUC transmitted for the 2021-2022 TPP was a 46 MMT portfolio. And this portfolio is currently being used by the CAISO to identify and authorize transmission development needed to accommodate new resource capacity expected to be built to meet that 46 MMT GHG target established in decision 2003-028. Um, and for the 2022-2023 TPP, the ruling suggests that the 38 MMT portfolio proposed to serve as the 2021 PSP portfolio be transmitted to CAISO as the base case portfolio. This would allow us to understand the transmission implications of the PSP portfolio, which will serve as the most up-to-date planning guidance for LSEs. Next. I want to touch on some of the transmission results of this portfolio. Uh, more detailed results can be found in the deck posted on the IRP events and materials webpage. Um, and as, as I explained earlier, these are indicative results that will undergo further analysis in bus bar mapping. And then the CAISO's TPP process will assess whether um, there is in fact any transmission needed. So the bar graph uh, on the slide demonstrates that although the resources selected by Resolve do use up some of the existing transmission space, a good amount of the transmission um, still remains available. And this is depicted by the dark blue bars and the dashed um, blue line bars. In three instances, Resolve determines to build, uh, to build out resources in a specific zone beyond the existing transmission limit. This is depicted in the brown color. When Resolve exceeds the available transmission capacity, it must then build out new transmission, and it does so in 2028 and in 2032, mostly to accommodate geothermal and wind development. One important thing to note here is that the dashed brown line depicts how much new transmission capacity would be available if the full transmission upgrade were to be implemented. Uh, and often a transmission upgrade allows for another 1,000 or 2,000 megawatts of resources um, to then be added. However, as you see by the shaded in brown bars, Resolve selects partial upgrades only. Next slide. A policy-driven sensitivity portfolio, similar to a policy-driven base case portfolio, is used to plan for policy goals. However, the results are information only. This past February, the CPUC transmitted to CAISO two sensitivity portfolios for the 2021-2022 TPP, a 38 MMT sensitivity portfolio and an offshore wind sensitivity portfolio, which will allow the CAISO to study transmission infrastructure needs and associated costs that would be triggered to connect over 8,000 megawatts of offshore wind generation at various potential locations. This, this information is currently lacking, so this will be very important for us to, to gain. Uh, for the 2022-2023 TPP, the ruling suggests one option for a sensitivity portfolio, a 30 MMT with high electrification portfolio. Next slide. The objective of the sensitivity portfolio would be to understand transmission um, uh, implications under a future that would require more resource development 
to meet a more stringent GHG target and a higher load. So for this reason, the portfolio is developed using a 30 MMT electric uh, sector target by 2030. So 27.7 MMTs by 2032. And high electrification assumptions consistent with a 2020 E3 report produced for CARB on achieving carbon neutrality in California. There are a number of relevant statutes and executive orders that point to futures consistent with a lower GHG target or high electrification. For example, 8 million ZEVs by 2030 to meet executive order N7920. So we, we hope to receive comments from parties on whether it is essential to study transmission needs to meet this goal and, um, and other goals uh, kind of noted in these executive orders and statutes. Transportation electrification is an important element of this portfolio because it can impact infrastructure needs in two ways. First, uh, an increase in peak load can increase reliability transmission needs. And additionally, transportation electrification may require more resource development and that greater renewable capacity can result in the need for uh, additional transmission development. Next slide. So with that in mind, uh, let's take a look at how the 30 MMT with high electrification portfolio compares to the 38 MMT core portfolio uh, proposed for uh, as the PSP. The 30 MMT high electrification portfolio includes nearly 25 gigawatts more of new resource capacity than the 38 MMT core portfolio, mostly new solar and battery resources. Approximately eight and a half gigawatts of the additions are driven by moving to the lower GHG target and approximately 16.7 gigawatts are driven by including that high electrification assumption. Uh, other small differences, as you can note in the graph, include a small decrease in shed VR and an increase in offshore wind. Next slide. But before a high electrification portfolio could be passed to KISO for a TPP assessment, more work needs to be done to determine whether now is the right time for the assessment and exactly what work would be required. A uh, number of things need to be considered. So for example, are the pathways high electrification assumptions that were used in Resolve appropriate? And since those assumptions are not captured by the existing um, single, single forecast set, what are the implications of deviating from the SFS agreement? Or would the next SFS forecast include high electrification assumptions? If so, uh, would resolve assumptions need to be updated and would staff have to rerun the portfolio to ensure consistency with the new forecast? Additionally, would the transmittal of the sensitivity um, in addition to the PSP mean that KISO would have to conduct the TPP assessments using two different load forecasts? And is this feasible under the TPP timeline? Because this isn't something the KISO has previously done. If so, how and, would, um, and when would the mapping of the load to transmission locations occur? And finally, what are the timing implications for the state's SB100 goals if a 30 MMT high electrification sensitivity is not considered in the 2022-23 TPP. These are all issues that we welcome party input on. Next slide. Finally, um, before the resource portfolios can be sent to KISO for the transmission assessment, these portfolios first need to be mapped to specific bus bars since KISO assessments are at the nodal level. Next. As I mentioned earlier, staff have made improvements to the bus bar mapping methodology to address party comments and to reflect resolve updates. Um, these improvements can be kind of found in detail in the actual methodology, but at a high level, they include utilization of the new KISO transmission deliverability data, incorporation of the new KISO transmission constraint definitions uh, for non-battery bus bar mapping, incorporation of bus bar level granularity of commercial interest rather than just the zonal level commercial interest and for all resources incorporation of expected online dates for commercial interest into the mapping criteria for allocation to bus bars 
um, also improved implementation of the bus bar mapping criteria and an update to the battery bus bar mapping steps to account for the locational information for battery resources that is now provided by Resolve. So with that, um, I think we can move to responding to questions. Carolina, thanks for that. This is Nathan again. Um, I think we can try to take a couple of questions verbally. Um, both you and Jared should uh, check your Q&A queue um, to see if there are ones that we think we can um, cover quickly. Um, otherwise, we can just count on um, finishing those in the next um, hour or two and having them uh, back to the question asker and then also aggregated into our um, Q and A list um, at the end of the meeting. Yeah, Jared, do you want to take the lead on any you have noted while as presenting? Yeah, yeah, I think I can answer two probably quick ones. The first one is from Tom Beach, uh, who asked, are the three partial transmission upgrades realistic to implement or do the whole upgrades need to be built? Uh, that yes, the it's the whole upgrades would likely need to be built based on the what the ISO has provided. And so that's part of the bus bar mapping process is as we're doing the mapping to the in, in, individual substations is assessing if the building of these three transmission upgrades are actually optimal or not. Uh, and then another quick question is from Michael, which is, for the transmission constraints discussed uh, on slide 73, does the model differentiate between new transmission versus expanded capacity along existing rights away? Uh, so these particular upgrades that are shown in the brownish gold here are, uh, are specific uh, upgrades provided or are in individual possible projects provided by the Cal ISO uh, that have an estimated megawatt amount they provide, an estimated cost for it, and an estimated time of construction. So those three factors are incorporated into resolve, into resolve when it is deciding if it needs to build a transmission upgrade. So I, I think the, 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 the question between expansion along, along existing rights away or essentially new transmission lines is factored into those estimates that the ISO provided. And Jared, thanks for that. Um, Carolina, were there any process related questions that you feel like you could address right away? Yeah, I'm scanning right now. Um, there's a question, let's see. Um, are any changes to the 2021-22 TPP expected based on the midterm procurement order? Um, I think that's most likely a question for the CAISO to see if they plan on, um, for example, you know, changing their study plan or the inputs that they use in any way. Um, uh, I think they have a stakeholder meeting coming up at the end of the month, so that might be a good format to um, to see if, if they will be doing any of those changes. Let's see. Carolina, I have a question. This, this is mm -hmm. correct, Jeff, and for you or Jared or Nathan. It, this is from Pushkar Wagel. Uh, it's about slide 72. I don't know if you could scroll up to that if you see that. And it mm -hmm. is. Why wouldn't the reliability and policy driven base case portfolios submitted for the 2022 23 TPP take into consideration the transmission scope and cost information for in CAISO transmission, out of state wind, and offshore wind developed as part of the 21 22 TPP, which is expected to be available by mid November? So that's the end. Um, then goes on to say the currently proposed portfolios, including the 38. MMT core portfolio likely lack that information. So do you, do you guys, yeah. feel, if you, can you answer that question now or do you want to reflect on it? Yeah, I can uh, provide a little information to that. It, that's an excellent question. And, you know, it's something that we are trying to figure out whether we can accomplish that. Um, 
So the challenge here is really the alignment, um, the timing of the processes. So as I noted earlier, um, the KISO results, for example, from the 20, um, uh, 2020, uh, sorry, uh, one TPP will be available, let's see, in, in November. Um, and so, you know, the question is, how, how do we make use of those results if they won't be available? Preliminary results will be available, uh, I believe, mid-November and final results won't be available until January or February of next year. Yet we, you know, are trying to stay on a schedule to have a decision adopted, I believe, by the end of this year. And therefore, um, you know, that requires us to uh, conduct bus bar mapping and to land on portfolios um, much earlier than when, you know, when the final KISO results will be available. So there's a bit of a disconnect there, but we are coordinating closely with KISO um, always to kind of see whether they have any preliminary um, information that we can make use of. And then I had a, a question similar to the one I think that, that Matt Friedman put in regarding um, how distributed energy resources behind the meter resources are being forecasted. And his question asks about behind the meter um, PV and is behind the meter PV and storage being considered candidate resources and selected based on cost. And how are the rate impacts of NIM tariffs being evaluated and um, could you address how um, potential future increased deployment of distributed energy resources is being forecasted? Sure, sure, Hauk, I can take a stab, but we might have to answer, especially the latter parts of the question separately, because um, it might take a little bit of digging. Um, but Matthew, it's a good question. Um, it's one that comes up a lot in IRP, especially when we start talking about um, our capacity expansion modeling. The short answer is that several types of BERs are available to the resolve model as candidate resources to build. That includes behind the meter PV, certain types of demand response, um, behind the meter uh, storage. Um, and those are all available uh, for view in our inputs and assumptions document um, that's publicly available um, for you to see what sort of costs and potential we're associating with those resources. Um, maybe by kind of implication, there's a statement in there that you don't often see them um, getting picked up uh, by the model as new resources to build um, you know, in, in future years. Um, we kind of already um, engaged an explanation of that um, in previous IRP workshops um, and um, proceeding level documents. But I think that the, the second question that you're getting to that we'll poke around a little bit on is, how do we characterize the costs of the other things that we would assume to be in the baseline? Um, which is basically um, a set of assumptions that we um, mostly take from the most recent IPER about how much behind the meter PV, energy efficiency, and other DERs are out there, um, and what costs do we associate with them. Um, that would also be available in our inputs and assumptions doc, but we'll try to get um, a quick reference for you um, here in this uh, uh, workshop Q&A, if that's all right. Yeah, thank you. Nathan, I can add on to that too. I just was looking up, uh, it looks like by 2032, behind the meter PV grows by about nine gigawatts. Uh, and behind the meter uh, batteries grow by uh, 1.1 gigawatts. So those are the, that's assumed in the baseline. Thanks for that, James. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, thank you, uh, Nathan, um, Carolina, uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. I, I don't have any questions on my end. Um, I'm, st I'm learning this, this aspect, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. This is uh, and I just wanted to oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Commissioner. So, so here's my question. Um, uh, it's here's what it is. So, the code base of the Resolve model was updated, uh, incorporating latest uh, functionality, uh, enabling the Resolve model to do all the various things <clears throat> that. The team has outlined and described um, comparisons to other models and so forth. What 
what overall gives the our CPUC team confidence that those code base updates um, are are appropriate and reliable? And I suppose that gets at that gets at testing <laughs> at the folks who are writing the code, you know, are testing what they're what they've created and what have you. Mr. This is Nathan. I think I understand the thrust of your question. Um, and might defer to um, Jared, Carolina, and others. Um, but after I say that we are confident um, in the appropriateness and kind of the robustness of the um, the update, uh, but we do understand that um, you know the update and just like any update that we do um, with the model um, can kind of uh, make waves a little bit um, in terms of just doing something new and different that um, we perceive as an improvement, uh, but. Um, can sometimes take some adjusting and perhaps I didn't answer your question. If, if not, please do uh, let me know. No, no that, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. I was just trying to add quickly. I think uh, one of the major changes that we implemented is incorporating, you know, the new uh, transmission limits from KISO. And so that's something where um, you know, it's not that dependent on maybe uh, resolve itself, but rather on kind of getting the correct information from KISO. Um, we did have to make some changes to really incorporate the new com complexity of it. But um, I think we've we've collaborated relative very closely with with KISO and others to make sure that the way that we are representing those new limits and the formulation of them um, accurately in Resolve. Good points, Carolina. And I'd also like to add on that um, probably goes without saying, but development um, and improvement here is an iterative process. So what we're stating is that we're confident that what we did represents an improvement over last time, but we're always seeking to improve further. And that's what we hope to be facilitating with this workshop um, and party comments. Yes, thank you. Yeah, there's the the code, the writing of the code itself to add in all these attributes and then there's the, the information that you feed into the model and the results. And I think you've, uh, you've, um, put into context the, uh, the results, uh, in, in the, in the slide deck and in your commentary. So thank you very much. And I'd just like to concur with that. This has been really helpful and informative and actually answered some questions that I had a little bit earlier in the presentation. So thank you. Just adding on there, one of the quality control checks we did with, with the new code base was to rerun the 2019-2020 RSP with the new code base. And we found that it selected very similar amounts and timing of resources. So that was that was a helpful check amongst the other QC that went on. Thank you. Good point, Neil. So those of you that did not have your question answered verbally in that session right there, um, you can expect um, something before the end of the session, um, as mentioned before. But otherwise, I think we can move on to our next section. OK. Great, thanks, Nathan. Um, yeah, so this uh, this final uh, section is on procurement and other PSP uh, related actions. Uh, the ruling poses a number of different options and considerations that are before us uh, in the PSP related to um, uh, the potential acceleration of procurement or ordering of procurement uh, for reasons related to reliability, greenhouse gas reductions, uh, retention of resources. So this, this section will be walking through those and putting them all in context. Uh, it's going to be broken into two uh, sort of subsections. So the first will uh, deal with more of the reliability-based uh, procurement considerations that were uh, posed in the ruling. We'll take a, we'll a Q&A session uh, after that, and then we'll follow that up with uh, another subsection that's focused more on GHG driven procurement and then some of the sort of portfolio uh, resource specific uh, GHG driven procurement um, uh, considerations posed in the ruling as well as uh, uh, storage as a placement for transmission. So to help tee it off, I'll pass it to Neil uh, who can give the broader uh, procurement context. 
Thanks, James. Good afternoon, everyone. Neil Rathman. Um, yeah, so to, to put what James was saying in other ways is we focused so far in the workshop on the composition of the portfolio, uh, the proposed portfolio. Um, and, and then we're really now asking questions um, about what actions are actually going to take to implement the portfolio. Um, so if you, if you take a step back and think of IRP process, the preferred system plan should comprise both the portfolio and then the actions. Um, so we talked about the portfolio of um, existing resources, you know, numbering what, 70 and 80 gigawatts of nameplate capacity, and then the, the 43 gigawatts or so that are assumed by 2030 in the proposed portfolio. Um, but now, now talking about actions. So these actions could range from procurement that be, would be required of LSCs. And we should note that um, in case of publicly owned utilities um, need to be considered as a part of this, noting that they're not um, CPUC jurisdictional. Um, there could be other actions required of LSCs and or there could be actions of by the commission. As well, I'll call out um, one of the key findings James um, summarized in his, his uh, earlier slides, which is that that 38 MMT core, portfo core portfolio that proposed the PSP indicates in rough, in, in rough sense that the LSC plans, if they're fully implemented, plus the, the midterm reliability procurement order also fully implemented, gets us pretty much, I think there are a couple other resources needed, but gets us almost all the way to achieve the Commission's reliability and GHG goals for 2030. So the, the uncertainty, though, lies within whether that, whether just adopting the portfolio uh, and then relying on existing markets and programs is sufficient um, or whether additional action is required. So th this, this uncertainty is, is something that the staff proposal uh, on a, a procurement framework in IRP that we released in November last year um, really tries to explore. Um, so we'll be referring to this staff proposal a few times um, like the ruling does, um, and you know we've already had some comment from from stakeholders in the lead lead up to the midterm reliability decision, um, commenting on parts of that proposal, and then this P, this PSP ruling presents another opportunity to ad advance the development of the, the framework, and, and particularly the GHG driven reduction um, resources and how to retain existing resources, which were not which were two topics not explored in depth in the midterm reliability decision. So then on, on the next slide, we've got a schematic which, which gives an overview of that staff proposals. So I'll just briefly um, introduce this and then lead into the, the content of the ruling. Um, to orient you with that schematic, um, the two columns on the left-hand side, um, those are steps in planning and procurement that the CPC uh, takes, whereas on the right-hand side, it's the load serving entities or other procuring entities for that matter, the steps that they take um, in planning and procurement. And then the rows uh, represent the, the top half being planning, the bottom half being procurement process. And the blue elements of this schematic are, are relatively well-defined uh, parts of these processes. Whereas the red, while they've been addressed in the two procure procurement actions taken so far in the IP proceeding, um, they're not yet established formally in an ongoing sense. Um, Okay, so then, so far this workshop's been about really the top half of this schematic. Um, you know, obviously focused on the PSP guidance and in parentheses there, I call out that's you know really about resource need determination. Whereas what we're going to talk about about now is procurement need de determination, and there's a, a distinction there, um, as well as the other steps uh, of procurement. So I'm going to hand over to the team um, to cover various parts of the ruling. Um, in uh, in the, the the two broad topic areas that uh, James described, so over to you, Lauren. All right, next slide, please. All right, so as Neil has just said, we are going to be discussing several procurement topics today that have been teed up in the ruling. Uh, the first is the potential need to take action on retention of existing resources. So thus far, uh, procurement orders in the IRP procurement track have been focused on bringing new resources online with the assumption that we have other mechanisms, RPS, RA, um, just general demand um, that keep the existing resources in the system. 
So this section of the ruling is focused on considering whether there are additional actions the commission needs to take to keep existing resources online that support both our system reliability, our greenhouse gas goals, or potentially meeting both goals. And so, as we've noted in our modeling, we typically assume that these existing resources remain online with some exceptions um, for known retirements of resources, as well as uh, some sensitivity on 40 year age based retirement for some thermal resources. However, our current programs may not be sufficient to retain these existing resources in the system. This is something we've been considering at the commission, as well as hearing from parties, particularly as it relates to both thermal resources and CHP resources. But we should note that this is an important consideration for all existing resources, particularly renewables that will help us meet our GHG goals. So the ruling, the PSP ruling is seeking feedback um, on specific actions the commission could take both in the short term and in the long term to make sure that our existing fleet of resources is able to stay online to meet our supply needs. This is particularly important as our modeling assumes that CHP resources remain online, but we have been hearing, uh, particularly in the record of the MTR decision, that these resources may not be fully contracted through the IRP planning period. And thus, it may require us to update our assumptions um, regarding these resources or, or as well to take action to make sure resources that are needed remain on the system. And so in th that's some potential short term actions that the commission could possibly take um, in the long term. It may be prudent to start thinking about more programmatic approaches to ensuring resource efficiency and I'll turn it back to Neil to discuss those. Neil, I think you're muted. Thanks, Warren. So yeah, just add a bit of color there. But programmatic approaches are called out in the ruling to distinguish from that paradigm of the commission, commission ordering um, procurement order by order. Um, so I suppose to, to define a, pro a program, in essence, um, you know, in summary, it's, it's, it's something that's once designed and established, then, it, then there would be ongoing and rolling requirements placed on those serving entities. Um, and then the, the program rules could be cal calibrated over time as policy objectives evolve or industry conditions change. Um, so we, we do touch on programmatic approaches in the GHG section later, um, but just to tie them to the topic of retention here, um, and again, pointing back to the November 2020 staff proposal, which the problem statement section of that explored uh, how the R RA program and RPS program uh, do and don't align with IRP objectives and find some gaps. Um, so that, that staff proposal then discusses options to include programmatic features in future, for example, including um, the full when doing need allocation, including the full um, portfolios of LSEs. Um, but then, but then in uh, in developing the midterm reliability order um, and the comments on that, um, the ruling itself and the comments explored how individual procurement orders necessitate a baseline to be fined in each instance of procurement and then delineation uh, between existing and new resources, whereas the programmatic approach could set a rolling to mid to long term requirement that LSCs then can then meet with a combination of existing and new resources. And then this way, some existing resources would be retained and it would be up to LSCs deciding which those are. So with that, back to you. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Neil. And now moving back to discussing new resources coming online. An additional action contemplated in this ruling is whether there's anything the commission can or should be doing to accelerate some of the online dates of some of the already authorized procurement in D2106035, which is the midterm procurement order we've been discussing. And so we are discussing this in light of near term stress grid conditions that I think we all know about. Uh, these conditions have caused Governor Newsom to proclaim a state of emergency on July 30th, 2021 to ensure sufficient supply through the fall and to work to accelerate resources that come online by next summer. And so as we work towards a 100% clean electricity system, 
this emergency proclamation is to safeguard the state's energy system this summer by launching contingency programs that will both reduce demand and increase supply, as well as to expedite clean energy projects to meet the challenge of the rapid acceleration of intensity and duration of record-breaking temperatures and severe drought conditions we've been discussing across the West. So specifically, this proclamation asks the CPUC to work with LSEs on accelerating procurement, uh, to expand and expedite demand response programs and storage and clean energy projects, and to work with the California Energy Commission, California Air Resources Board, and the California Independent Sess System Operator to identify and prioritize actions to accelerate the carbon-free energy transition. And so um, this proclamation is being addressed in multiple CPUC proceedings, um, both this proceeding, the summer reliability proceeding, and several other proceedings um, to distinguish what will be addressed here versus what will be addressed in the summer reliability rulemaking, uh, which is R211003. Um, the summer reliability rulemaking will address the possibility of accelerating the near-term and mid-term procurement order obligations to 2022, as well as many other uh, demand-side and supply-side actions. Whereas in this proceeding, we will address acceleration of procurement obligations achievable in the year 2023, um, as the actions for 2022 are being addressed in the other proceeding. And so in terms of 2023 procurement obligations, as decided, uh, D2106035 will bring 2,000 megawatts NQC online by August 1st, 2023. Um, the ruling asks whether it be prudent to accelerate some additional procurement in order to bring instead 4,000 megawatts online by that date or some similar quantity. And so we're looking for feedback from stakeholders here particularly considerations on the level of need in 2023, how much procurement is feasible to accelerate and the uh, development risks associated with doing so. All right, let's move to the next slide. All right, thank you. So moving to the next procurement topic we have, um, is the potential for fossil fuel procurement as part of this ruling, as well as the role that renewable or green hydrogen could play if such procurement is authorized um, or ordered in this decision. And so as stakeholder, stakeholders may recall, uh, the record leading up to the MTR decision, uh, D2106035, discuss the possibility of authorizing or ordering some fossil procurement. Um, the decision ultimately stated that additional analysis was needed and ordered the CPUC to work with the CEC on conducting such analysis. And so D2106035 did not allow the procurement obligation to be met with any fossil resources. And so now we both have and are still conducting some additional analysis that will help us guide this decision on whether fossil procurement is needed. Uh, the first piece of this is the PCM analysis that we have discussed earlier. Uh, I won't say a lot here as that has been thoroughly covered, but uh, you know, the core finding is that this 38 MMT core portfolio um, considering D2106035 as ordered being fully met um, that is found to be generally reliable, um, but, you know, there are still some other considerations we're going to address. Um, one example being the sensitivity that looked at bringing long lead time resources online by 2026, rather than by allowing them to be extended to 2028, found significant reliability benefit in doing so. However, we do know it may be challenging to bring those long lead time resources online in such a time frame. And additionally, we are going to consider the analysis that the CEC is conducting regarding the reliability of the KISO system. Um, they discussed their draft results from this study um, at a workshop that they held on Monday. And so we'll say a little bit more about this on the next slide. And so just as a recap, 
why are we considering this procurement? Um, in the MTR decision, uh, we discussed some of the potential reasons that incremental fossil capacity um, at existing sites could be beneficial, um, which included a lack of data on the performance of batteries at the scale that we will be seeing in the coming years. Um, potentially that expansions at existing sites uh, may be a resource that's able to be expeditiously procured and built to meet some of our very near-term stressed grid condition needs and potentially to mitigate concerns about the large resource buildouts and development risk um, in some of the coming years. And finally, that our IRP resolve modeling consistently finds the need to retain most of the thermal fleet through the planning period. Um, and this could potentially mean that it may be optimal to allow some older resources to retire and instead replace some of that capacity uh, with newer, more efficient resources. And so moving with great next slide. And so to start, we'll say a little bit more about the CEC draft study, um, the results of which were presented earlier this week. Um, the CEC workshop discussed four goals, looking at the reliability of the KISO system under a number of different scenarios, um, seeing if portfolios of different resources have different reliability benefits, particularly if there is any additional reliability benefit of gas procurement, uh, looking at the performance and development risk of batteries, and looking at what thermal capacity may be available at existing sites should it be ordered. And so um, there's a lot more detail um, in the CEC docket on this. Um, I think the slides and recordings of that have been posted, but just to say briefly, uh, the draft study did find reliability when the MTR order is met largely from the years 2023 to 2026, um, but there is concern regarding 2022, which is before the MTR uh, order goes into effect. Additionally, um, their scenarios of gas procurement did not find them to be to provide additional reliability benefit over procurement uh, by preferred resources. And so parties are invited to provide comments directly to the CEC on the study. Um, as well as to comment in this proceeding on the implications of that study for any procurement actions that should arise in this proceeding. And so uh, to address renewable hydrogen, um, another topic we had begun discussing in the record of D2106035 was the role of renewable hydrogen. If the commission orders additional gas capacity, we want to make sure we are also advancing the transition to clean resources and the path to decarbonization. Um, and so, um, if procurement is needed for fossil fuel resources, the ruling proposes that some portion be eligible or required to use renewable hydrogen. Um, there were concerns um, in the record of the MTR decision around what do we mean by when, by we, when we say green or renewable hydrogen as well as the feasibility of the proposed quantities. And so just to note, the commission has not yet defined green hydrogen, and we will not be setting a definition uh, of green or renewable hydrogen in this proceeding. However, we are proposing to adopt the explanation of renewable hydrogen as used in the self-generation incentive program, decision D2106005. And so just to explain uh, the SGIP decision uh, used renewable hydrogen to mean hydrogen produced at a project site or delivered to a project site by vehicle or dedicated pipeline that was produced through non-combustion thermal conversion of biomass or electrolysis using 100% renewable energy as defined by the renewable portfolio standard um, adding large hydropower to that definition and excluding purpose grown crops. And for the context of this decision, we would have uh, an amendment that if 
uh, if using grid supplied electricity, the associated RECs must be retired to qualify as renewable hydrogen. And we would further note that this does not allow for directed or injected uh, renewable hydrogen to be included. And so that covers the definition uh, in terms of how renewable hydrogen might be part of fossil, a fossil fuel procurement order. One proposal included in the ruling would be to require that 50% of the fossil fuel facilities um, that would be procured um, should fossil fuel procurement be ordered um, require 50% to utilize at least 30% renewable hydrogen when the contract terms begins to increase that uh, capacity to 60% renewable hydrogen by the year 2031 and to have achieved 100% renewable hydrogen no later than the year 2036. Additionally, we would require that the facility using renewable hydrogen would be required to maintain or reduce the actual emission rates of NOx compared to the use of natural gas, as well as to employ equipment to reduce NOx emissions to the maximum extent possible. All right, uh, next slide. Okay, and this is the last procurement topic we will cover before taking a few questions. Um, the ruling also contemplated beginning to consider locationally targeted procurement, beginning with the procurement that could potentially reduce the reliance on the Aliso Canyon natural gas storage facility. Currently, the Aliso Canyon proceeding is looking at the impact of a potential closure of Aliso Canyon in either 2027 or 2035 and the impact of such a closure on both the electric and gas systems. That ongoing analysis is being conducted by FTI and is considering what investment options would be optimal or would need to occur in order to allow Liso Canyon to potentially close in one of those target years. We have begun to discuss this topic in the IRP proceeding, but we are seeking to more deeply establish the record here with this ruling. In the MTR decision, the commission discussed the need to plan long-term regarding natural gas generation capacity. This is also related to the current modeling question of the relationship of electric reliability and the Aliso Canyon gas storage facility. Additionally, we have heard from a number of parties on the need to prioritize these Aliso Canyon interactions in the IRP proceeding, as well as the need to prioritize planning to reduce reliance on natural gas in the LA Basin area. These comments have come both in response to the MTR decision as well as in the scoping of this proceeding. And so understanding the impact of Aliso Canyon on the electric system in the LA Basin and how it would impact both the local and system reliability is very complex modeling endeavor. Um, that FTI consulting is beginning to work on and we may uh, need to conduct additional modeling as well to fully understand. However, this makes similarly complex um, understanding whether there are any short-term actions or no regrets actions IRP could take as ALISO continues to be fu more fully studied. One example of a least regret solution that's been proposed would be to begin siting batteries in the LA Basin to potentially alleviate some of the reliance on gas there. However, without longer term analysis, the impacts of that are harder to predict and harder to rule out potential unintended consequences, such as batteries charging from gas and perhaps increasing rather than reducing reliance on nearby plants. And so to balance the complexity of these questions with the need to move quickly in order to meet the timeframes envisioned for the closure of Aliso Canyon, we are seeking party feedback on whether there are any short-term actions the commission could take this year prior to the completion of FTI's full analysis, such as potentially ordering that some quantity of the resources being brought online to meet MTR be located in a specific geographic region like the LA Basin. Such an order would require answering, again, some of the difficult questions we have gone through for both the D-1911-016 
and D2106035 procurement orders. What is the appropriate quantity of resources to be located in a specific area? And should they be batteries or other resources? To which LSEs would such a need be allocated? And which entities should be the ones to conduct the actual procurement? As well as additionally, whether what enforcement mechanisms would be required or optimal for such geographically oriented procurement. All right, and I think we can move to the next slide and now take some questions. Lauren, thanks for that. Um, fantastic presentation and just a, a note, which I think would already be on parties' minds is, you know, um, James noted at the transition that we're kind of going from the first half of the presentation, which is planning track to more procurement related things um, in the section that you just heard, which is, you know, what a lot of you are seeing is where the rubber meets the road. We really want you to focus on uh, your comments to the content that was just covered there um, and what's about to be covered um, in the coming section. Um, we are a tad behind in terms of time. Um, Lauren and Neil, I'd implore you guys to look in your question queues to see if there's anything you can answer right away. Um, I'm going to uh, attempt to um, take a look at Mary Neil's question of what leads the CPC to support green hydrogen without any resolved modeling of green hydrogen. Um, Mary, I'd actually point you to other analyses that have been done with Resolve and also um, with other tools, um, analyzing things that I think the CEC's FD100 study characterizes as zero carbon firm resources, um, which you could kind of think of um, as a stand-in for a broad resource category um, that could um, capture that. Um, and you do see in some scenarios, especially further out in the planning horizon, um, for those to be um, deemed as optimal. Um, and so that's one of, I think, several data points that we use when thinking about, you know, is this a, a resource to consider for the future? Neil, Lauren, are there any easy ones um, or quick ones for you? Otherwise, yeah. we can just follow up by text. Yeah, I've got, I've got a few here, never easy, but maybe quick. Um, Doug Carper asks about a sense of, um, of when the modeling showing how different levels of the PRM would translate into loss of load expectations. Um, so yeah, I, I I kind of bundled that into the broad uh, commitment that the MTR decision made to conduct an analytical and stakeholder process um, across IRP and RA proceedings to examine that, but also the reverse, you know, um, what PRM is needed to meet a point one loss of load um, in the long term uh, and and interim. Um, so I, I acknowledge the question, and, and I note the ruling does not propose. Uh, to adopt a PRM, um, it's just uh, representing the midterm reliability procurement, um, and no, we don't have a stated timing for that exercise. But um, you know, I think staff acknowledge the significance of it. Um, and then the Mary Neil had a couple of questions. <clears throat> um, one about slide eighty-five and um, how Lauren described the ruling question posed about twenty twenty-three. Um, and queries whether we would need any additional procurement for 2023 when the CEC's results just reported on Monday show the portfolio is reliable. Um, I, I think that's that's something uh, we sh the, both the CEC and, and the CPC uh, would appreciate comments on. I will note that the CEC staff commented that, um, among other things, the load forecast didn't take into account um, you know, potential climate effects on load, um, which is some of the context given in the ruling questions on 2023. Um, and then another question about batteries and uh, slide 86, um, summarizing the ruling, you know, pointing about potential over reliance of use of batteries from an operational perspective. Um, Mary Neal says, you know, their, their commercial technology and performance can be covered under warranty. Um, uh, is it is a continued fear of lack of energy being available to charge batteries? No, um, reliability modeling uh, addresses whether there's sufficient charging in the batteries. I think the question uh, is, will will, will batteries actually perform as modeled? Um, and uh, you know, I, I think just representing that we're going from a uh, already significant level of batteries, uh, particularly this summer online, and um, you know, planning to increase that multiple times over the next few years. So I think the ruling actually gets 
uh, you seek feedback on how uh, the operational performance of the battery fleet over this summer could help inform the, the question that Mary is raising there. That's, I think, all I've got for now. Thanks for that, Neil. Lauren, if you don't have any to jump in with, um, perhaps we can move to the next section. Uh, yeah, let's move to the next section. Okay, great. Um, so now we're going to talk about, uh, now as we transition uh, away from more reliability driven uh, procurement um, discussions towards newer terrain of GHG driven procurement, um, uh, I'll, I'll point out that this was floated uh, in the ruling and that it could potentially stem from the final PSP uh, and that it's a new idea which was explored in the December 2020 procurement uh, staff proposal that Neil talked about uh, at the beginning of this section, uh, but that has not been implemented. Some parties might remember that this topic did come up in the context of MTR comments, but the commission felt at that time that it was premature to consider GHG driven procurement due to the imminent reliability need uh, and the ability to more holistically consider the state's greenhouse gas needs through the preferred system plan. Therefore, this ruling advances the concept uh, of potentially requiring GHG reduction driven procurement and seeks to further uh, develop the record on the procurement steps that would be needed to figure that out. Uh, these steps include need determination, need allocation, procurement entities, cost allocation, compliance, monitoring, enforcement, uh, all, all the steps that have accompanied the previous procurement orders. Uh, next slide, please. So this ruling proposes two potential paths for potentially ordering greenhouse gas procurement. The first is what we're calling bottom up. This stems from the ruling's finding that LSE plans when combined with the ordered MTR procurement amounts would uh, achieve the 38 million metric ton GHG goal when combined with about 200 megawatts of solar in 2030. Uh, this, this option would simply require LSEs to go out and procure what they said they were going to procure in their plans, either with the exact resources that they included in their plans or the attributes associated with those resources, like, um, for example, clean gigawatt hours. This would address a number of the tricky issues that have come up uh, in procurement uh, previous procurement orders, like need determination, need allocation, uh, and who is the procurement entity, because that's all basically spelled out in LSC plans. But other details like uh, compliance, monitoring, enforcement would all have to be developed uh, new for this type of uh, this type of procurement order. Uh, going down the road of bottom up uh, procurement also raises uh, some downstream questions about the future of IRP. Um, if we did this, what would be the implications for future LSE plans? Um, if planned resources are expected to be procured, uh, would the uh, would the plan still be planning documents, or would they would they morph into procurement compliance documents? Uh, and what flexibility would there be to uh, improve on planned resources um, as resource costs and other industry conditions change? Um, would we be locking in this certain set of resources and reducing flexibility uh, to shift as conditions on the ground change? Alternatively, a top-down approach would look more like previous IRP procurement orders, uh, where the commission establishes a system level procurement need determination and then allocates that need out to the individual LSEs. Um, so an example of that would be taking the PSP or some portion of the PSP and then ordering that to be procured and figuring out uh, how much of it each LSE has to, has to uh, show up with. We're, we're also open uh, as, um, as Neil and Lauren were discussing earlier to establishing more ongoing programmatic approaches uh, in IRP to ensure ongoing procurement um, so that we're not doing this order by order. Uh, and so um, those would include the options that that Laura had discussed in the retention of existing resources section. So we're seeking party comment on whether you support the commission ordering GHG driven procurement. Uh, and if so, if you prefer bottom up or top or a top down approach, and if you have recommendations on, on these implementation details. Next slide. 
so I have now mentioned knee determination a few times. So here are a few visual representations of what could be in scope for a potential procurement order. Uh, the figure on the left comes from the December staff proposal. The black bars along the bottom are baseline resources. Uh, these are resources that are online now, which we expect to stay online in the future. And then layered on top of those in the gray and white bars are the plan resources, which can be thought of as the proposed PSP. To, to uh, arrive at the procurement need, do, it's a question of whether we assume all uncontracted resources in the portfolio will show up. So should we just, we just count on them uh, uh, being developed uh, or only some? And if it's some, uh, which uh, ones should we consider coming online? Um, and so what would be subject to a procurement order uh, and what can we assume um, would, would, could show up without uh, a procurement order? Um, in other words, what, on what portion of the PSP does the commission need to, to take action? Uh, the figure on the right uh, uses the 2030 uh, proposed system plan portfolio as an example. Um, this is an illustrative example of the various elements of the of the PSP. So down at the bottom, you've got LSE contracted. So these are some portion of the of the resources in the portfolio uh, did have contracts behind them. Uh, some of them had not yet been approved by the CPC uh, when when uh, plans were submitted. Uh, on top of that, you've got some amount of resources that are in the portfolio that uh, are subject to a procurement order. Uh, we went through efforts to make sure that the PSP portfolio was reflective of procurement orders. Uh, and so some of those we can be reasonably uh, sure will come online because uh, we've already ordered them to show up for liability reasons. Uh, then you've got a few uh, more speculative resource categories uh, above that, which we're calling LSE plan up to RPS and then LSE plan incremental to RPS. Um, this is to get across the idea that the RPS program on its own is going to drive the development of uh, renewable resources. Um, this was sort of a, a rough back of the envelope calculation of, uh, you know, what portion on top of everything else might be driven by a 60% RPS requirement uh, by 2030. Um, and, uh, and then there's additional renewable, you know, RPS eligible generation uh, that's included in LSE plans. Um, so both the green uh, and, and orange LSE plan bars are in the LSE plans, um, but incremental to the RPS. Um, and that's that's needed to uh, hit the GHG target. Uh, and then there's a sliver on top of that that's actually beyond the orders, beyond the uh, the the plans. That's the resolve selected amount. Um, so that's that's completely unplanned for, and it represents 286 megawatts uh, of solar. So these are these are this is the 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 scope of the PSP that could potentially be uh, subject to procurement order. There's the entire PSP. Um, there's just the planned resources, just those planned resources that are beyond RPS, uh, and just the those uh, completely unplanned resolve only resources. And you could imagine how we could design uh, an order or, or a program uh, that could that could accommodate those. Um, then there's also the baseline that sits below. Maybe that could be included, uh, especially as it relates to the retention of existing resources. So I, I'm trying here to describe uh, some approach to creating a broad procurement framework to ensuring that the PSP resources needed to reduce GHGs actually show up. Uh, but there are also resource specific actions that the commission can take, particularly for those resources that have more uh, unique regulatory needs, which could be part, uh, which could be part of a broader procurement framework, uh, or could be uh, targeted tangential actions that we take while a framework gets developed. Um, so to lead that off, uh, Carolina is going to talk about uh, out-of-state wind specific considerations. Thanks, James. All right, so the planning for out-of-state resources and the potential procurement of these resources is an important but complex uh, topic. The reason for this is because it's not just a question of resources, but importantly, it's also a question of major transmission development. Of all the planning um, and procurement that IRP is currently looking at, 
out-of-state resources likely require the largest investments in transmission. Um, and to further complicate matters, these transmission expansions would be required outside of the existing KISO system. So at the top, I want to provide a reminder of the amount of out-of-state resources on new transmission we're looking at. The reliability-based case scenario transmitted to KISO in February included 3,000 megawatts of out-of-state resources on um, a new, sorry, uh, included um, 1,100 megawatts um, of out-of-state resources on new transmission um, outside of KISO. That's the, that's the base case. Um, the sensitivity portfolio transmitted to KISO in February included um, 3,000 megawatts of out-of-state resources on new transmission. Um, and the preliminary TPP results should be available um, in November, uh, as I started as stated earlier. Um, and uh, these results will provide information on um, what transmission upgrades may be necessary within the KISO system to accommodate the injection of these out-of-state resources into KISO. But also, KISO is planning to conduct a comparison of four potential out-of-state transmission projects. And CPC staff expect that this, too, will be very informative. The map on the right, although um, a bit outdated, depicts the locations of a majority of the projects that the KISO will be assessing this fall. Now, the proposed PSP uh, 38 MMT core portfolio includes 1500 megawatts of wind on a new out of state transmission. There is a question of whether the Commission can count on these resources to be procured through existing programs such as RPS or whether CPC action is required to ensure their procurement. And there are several ways in which the Commission could act to support additional development of out of state renewables and the transmission to support them. Uh, some options include ordering procurement of a specific amount of resources from a particular state or states. Another option is identifying particular transmission projects with specific endpoints uh, that should be developed to facilitate imported renewables. And yet another option is working with other state and federal counterparts to ensure transmission siting and construction. Next slide. So there are a number of factors to keep in mind when considering actions the Commission can take to facilitate access to out-of-state resources. The certainty of need is one. Um, LSE plans included New Mexico and Pacific Northwest wind resources on existing transmission, but no LSEs included out-of-state resources requiring new transmission. So resources in states such as Wyoming or Idaho were not included in LSE plans. Uh, next is KISO control and management. Some out-of-state uh, transmission projects would likely sign a sponsor agreement with the KISO and join the transmission control area, while other projects would not be built to connect directly to the KISO grid, and the KISO would therefore not have the same level of operational control over those facilities. Next, we have resource adequacy eligibility as a factor to consider, and an important question is whether KISO would have long-term access to the out-of-state resources. Out-of-state transmission projects that do not connect directly to the KISO would rely on existing third-party transmission to connect to KISO intertie. Future access to these resources may therefore be dependent on third-party transmission availability and the duration of their contracts. Another factor to consider is how the various known out-of-state resource and transmission projects would help fulfill state policy goals and what benefits they would provide. Um, an improved understanding of how those benefits and these major resource and transmission combinations compare could help determine how uh, prescriptive the commission should be. And all of these uh, factors can contribute to the determination of whether a procurement order um, or different CPC action is necessary to ensure out-of-state resource procurement. Um, finally, if procurement were to be found, uh, or the procurement need were to be found, then many of the standard considerations um, covered in the procurement framework staff proposal would apply. So these include um, issues such as what exactly is the amount 
the timing and the specificity of the need, how the responsibility for the procurement need should be allocated among LSEs. Um, will self-provision work or is a central procurement entity necessary? Uh, of course, uh, cost allocation and compliance monitoring and enforcement provision. Next, I'll pass it to David to Thanks. discuss offshore wind. Yeah, another long lead time resource that may warrant unique consideration is we tee it up in the in the ruling here is offshore wind. There have been um, a number of developments and frankly momentum regarding the potential development of floating wind turbines off the California coast, primarily the central and northern coast area. Um, the ruling notes that, at least in the IRP context, that offshore wind as a resource is highly likely to be a default candidate resource in the uh, coming IRP cycle, which will be beginning uh, in the next few months. Um, and as we've talked about before earlier, that um, we are eagerly awaiting the ISO's analysis of the sensitivity case in this current TPP um, that studies um, the transmission implications of a lot of offshore wind on the central and northern coast and will offer a lot of informational value for, for um, stakeholders and future um, resources. Uh, analysis and um, just a reminder too, there is a, a task force of um, California agencies um, led by the CEC and I believe the federal BOEM, uh, the Federal Bureau of Energy Management. I I know Commissioner Rechhoffen and Commissioner uh, Gunda are involved in this task force. They are. Uh, helping to coordinate uh, among state agencies and the federal government offshore wind development. The, the ruling does tee up uh, a couple of potential near term actions that the PUC could take to facilitate offshore wind development. One of which involves in the central coast area, the, um, trend, the so called transmission headroom that will likely be available upon the retirement of, of some generation, including Diablo Canyon in the central coast area. I would um, remind you that this this could include this could include the um, transmission deliverability rights, which extend three years beyond the actual retirement of those generating facilities. So we tee it up. Uh, we invite comments on on whether uh, there are ways that the PUC could act to possibly preserve this transmission headroom for off wind. Off, uh, offshore wind resources, um, whether it's advisable and how, how we might be able to do that. We also tee up the, um, the question of whether a certain amount of megawatts should be included in the base case portfolios for the next TPP cycle, which would be discussed about a year from now, since uh, as we discussed earlier, that there's likely not time to incorporate the sensitivity studies from this TPP cycle into the one that Carolina is leading the effort to um, develop and transmit to the ISO early next year. We invite comments obviously on other actions um, that could facilitate the offshore wind resource development, which again has a long lead time and involves a lot of coordination between agencies, including the federal government. Um, finally, I, I'd like to tee up um, at least highlight the um, this this uh, concept that um, the PUC has been long um, urging the ISO, and the ISO has has been very good to incorporate analysis that looks at non-transmission alternatives for mitigating reliability uh, issues, um, and in the um, 2020, 2021 TPP, it's reflected actually, if you look in the 2021 transmission plan that's posted on the ISO website on page 114 and 120, the, I, the ISO identifies po the potential um, for two separate transmission or two separate storage projects that could 
mitigate the reliability need for transmission. And they, they, um, this may be the first time the ISO has actually identified storage projects that could mitigate a reliability need. We find this a very good development and we want to encourage that similar um, future efforts to identify this because generally these non-transmission alternatives are a lot cheaper um, than building transmission. So we recognize there could be some challenges in the development and the procurement of those resources at those specific locations, particularly for storage, whether at times it could be acting as a transmission facility in a sense, or whether it could be a market resource or how, how best um, the PUC could help facilitate um, procurement and development at those two specific sites. Um, and this really leads to a, a broader a broader issue, which Neil had already talked about earlier, but but he can expand upon it a little bit more about facilities or resources that can that can be mutually beneficial to the system as well as in in individual um, resources as well. But Neil can yeah. And thanks, David. Yeah, I think what the ruling is getting at, and as, as David's indicating with this example, is that there are opportunities where no single entity is going to have the commercial incentive to uh, procure what actually might be for rate payer benefit. Um, so this is something, you know, we call it system benefit. Don't confuse that with RA, pro, RA program system. We're just talking in general here. Um, mutual benefit is, is what's used in the staff proposal in the, from November. Um, and so in the staff proposal, there's an option that goes into detail on this that the, the ruling refers to, which is that, um, you know, how to how to deal with this challenge? What if any LSC, not or even a non LSC, could apply to undertake the procurement, and then gain certainty of the cost recovery, and then go ahead and do the procurement, um, similar to the current cost allocation mechanism CAM, but not limited to IOUs performing it, um, and then it would likely need to, you know, an approved entity would then likely need to gain commission approval um, of for each resource that it. That it proposes to procure, similar to the the current process for much of the IOU's procurement. Okay, so that, that concludes our summary uh, of of the various uh, topics, procurement or other action related in the ruling, um, in, in aid of developing the PSP. And yes, I turn it back to James, uh, or, or you know, questions uh, on this topic and maybe perhaps more broadly. Thanks, Neil. <clears throat> um, are there any, uh, Nathan, are there any questions that, uh, in, in the Q&A that uh, you think we should address publicly? James, it's a good question. I would actually defer to um, the half dozen of you or so that might still have a question in your queue that you um, want to prioritize answering verbally. Um, if it's not the case um, and you guys um, have basically taken care of everything um, through the text function in the Q&A bar. Um, perhaps we can um, just kind of pause and see if there's questions from the commissioners and then think about closing remarks. Yeah, Nathan, I've got a question here, a sort of process question um, from Ed Smeloff, which asks, what is the general timing for a commission incremental procurement order? Would it only occur after the CEC reliability analysis and the adoption of the PSP? Um, and I mean, my, my thought is that the PSP decision is certainly, like as I was trying to explain, is certainly adoption, a, a point at which the Commission could take action that, that supports the implementation of the portfolio. Um, and then I, I guess it just depends on the, the urgency of the need for the Commission to take action, whether it does uh, use the PSP decision to do that or a uh, decision uh, into some somewhere into next year or you know the next IAP cycle. Excellent point, Neil. So should we turn to the commissioners? Questions from commissioners? This is Genevieve. Um, so on we the certainly are, yes. On the Diablo Canyon <clears throat> power plant and the uh, transmission infrastructure there, pardon me, 
because this is the notion that with Central Coast offshore wind, that infrastructure could could be used. Um, what is the process for for ex expanding beyond the three years? Is this something that goes through the CQC C or through FERC? Um, what's if I'm understanding what was what was said about that <clears throat> that dam looking infrastructure for offshore wind? It's a good question. We're continuing legal research into exactly that that question. Mm -hmm. um, when I mentioned deliverability rights, that is a construct of the ISO, which is FERC regulated, and um, um, uh, the CAISO tariff currently allows deliverability rights to be maintained up to three years beyond the um, retirement of the generation. But um, again, it's it's um, it's an open question that we're we're investigating further, and we invite stakeholder comments on it. As, Eric, as a, I'm sorry. Sharon, just to add to what David said, it, things have been moving really fast with offshore wind, and possibilities have now emerged, especially with the Biden administration's change of heart. As David indicated, we're very encouraged, and we're doing a lot. This the IRP team and others are doing a lot to position ourselves to take advantage of this resource if if it's appropriate. And this is just one obvious asset that we want to look at as quickly as possible to make sure that if development does occur in that area, we can take advantage of existing transmission that's there. Because obviously there's assets that have been interconnected for a very long time, distribution right facilities and so forth. So it's as David indicated, it's complicated. We don't have you know, we don't know the right answer, but we're looking at it. We invite comments from uh, the parties and we want to get the best handle on it so that we can be best positioned to take advantage of this promising resource. Um, as a, a follow up on that, are you also looking at possible interconnections up north at Humboldt Bay and down south where San, um, San Onofre is located? They potentially have transmission interconnections or access areas, but. Um, yeah, I, Commissioner, the, the North Coast um, is, uh, so the, the, the Federal Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, who is running the siting and permitting uh, for these, these waters have designated um, two focus call areas, um, one being Morrow Bay, and one being uh, off Humboldt on the north coast. Um, so we've been talking about Morrow Bay. Regarding the north coast, that is uh, one of the resources that's getting studied as part of the current 2021-2022 TPP sensitivity study. Um, it, it's clear to everyone that that system can't um, take you know gigawatts worth of offshore wind without significant transmission upgrade. So that TPP sensitivity study is going to be important to find out um, the costs of expanding that part of the system. Thank you. Um, so uh, just a uh, uh, think more of a quick comment um, than than his question. Uh, so the last uh, presentation, especially um, uh, Lauren, thank you so much for that excellent presentation in Kind of connecting the uh, the planning and the procurement regime um, in in the IRP. I think it's, it was an ex um, uh, excellent uh, kind of overview. Uh, I, I do just want to um, uh, share that I'm uh, I, I'm personally I think uh, encouraged with the idea of thinking through uh, long lead term resources as, as a potential um, you know way of of securing procurement uh, through the IRP. Uh, process are handled here, um, given given that you know as, as um, uh, Neil pointed out and uh, early on there is, and, and I think David also pointed uh, we do have uh, an interagency SB 100 kind of coordination on implementation that's happening, and over and over the long lean term uh, questions come in. So to the extent that uh, some of these things are handled, whether it might be transmission or specific technologies. Um, uh, are, are out of state uh, resources, but also uh, I think I just wanted to put a plug in for uh, potentially um, 
long duration uh, storage and such that could uh, become extremely important um, in, in the coming years or the late, late in this decade. So just wanted to uh, uh, kind of frame the importance and acknowledge uh, the great work the ILP team is doing. This, is, this has been an excellent um, presentation and workshop in, in great detail. Thank you all. Mr. Sure, Gunda, thank you for your kind remarks. Um, are there any other questions, comments uh, from commissioners? Well, are we ready to are we ready to close, Nathan? Or are you asking for questions? Or are we? I do want to. I I think we we're ready to close um, with one small piece of housekeeping for uh, parties that have questions that might still be outstanding. There are. Um, two or three still in the queue. Um, what we're going to be doing is seeking to answer those within the format um, that they currently stand. So basically not closing the WebEx. Um, but if your question has not been answered within the next couple of minutes, um, feel free to sign off and we will be posting these uh, publicly within a day or two of um, now and making it very clear to parties where to find them on the website. Also, as a reminder uh, to everybody, um, we hope that everything in this workshop, uh, including the, the questions that we post, will be useful uh, for the submission of comments, which are due on September 27th, followed by uh, reply comments on October 11th. Um, we've posed a lot of questions here. Uh, the, the ruling seeks a lot of feedback on, on some big topics. Uh, so I, I encourage everybody uh, out there to uh, to put their thoughts and, and recommendations uh, into comments uh, and and uh, submit them on September 27th um, so that we can incorporate them uh, in time to issue proposed decision in November. And we are aiming to have a final PSP decision in December. Thanks for that, James. Um, Commissioner Rexhoff, do you have any um, finishing or closing remarks? I want to thank everybody uh, for their participation today, the, the extremely well-informed questions and thoughtful comments from the audience. I really want to just underscore how grateful I am for the work of the IR, IRP, IRP team. Uh, you can see how seamlessly they worked together handing off from one to another as they go through incredibly complex material. And now to add to their superpowers, they can respond to 55 highly technical questions in real time before the meeting's even over. So kudos to you for uh, being so responsive to the public. And more broadly, we are working on incredibly important and challenging issues here and you can see how the team is responding in real time in this in the proposed decision and in the analysis to things like the drought that just arrived and new climate uh, impacts, the, the developments in offshore wind, new policy developments from the news administration and executive orders accelerating goals to deal with short-term reliability issues. It's incredibly sophisticated and important and I want to compliment you for breaking it down into bite-sized pieces and really providing full transparency on everything that you've done. It's really a remarkable effort and a pleasure to listen to it. I want to thank Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Sharoma and Halk for joining us. President Badger had to leave at some point in the middle. Uh, she was on the phone, not on camera because of technical difficulties, but she texted me and said she found the presentations extremely valuable. And I want to thank again uh, my colleague from uh, from the Energy Commission, Commissioner Gunda, for his work and leadership on this effort and part a partnership with us and, and his very very thoughtful insights. With that, that's all I have. We look forward to a lot of great comments on all these many many issues that the parties will be providing us. We very much second that and appreciate it, Commissioner. I think that that concludes today's workshop. Just a note for parties that um, are hanging around for their questions. It might take us a few minutes and there won't be any more content covered um, in the workshop verbally right now. It'll be just us trying to get the last couple straggler questions answered um, in this text uh, 
Q&A format so that the list that we post in a day or two is comprehensive. But thank you everyone for your engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.